This is Linux Unplugged, episode 124 for December 22nd, 2015. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's phoning it in for the holidays. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Oh, I tease. Actually, Wes, I'm pretty excited about today's episode. You should be. <laughs> Thank you. We have some good stuff lined up. We're going to do a retrospective of some of the more relevant topics we covered this year. Uh, I Like I was teasing previously on the pre-show, this is the episode that makes everybody sound really smart. I just take their best bits and we throw it into this week's episode. Because they're awesome. We yeah. love our audience. Yeah, and then when we come back on the week after Christmas, we're going to look back at some of these topics, and we're going to look forward to 2016 as well. So I think we have a pretty good show lined up, so stick with us for our special holiday episode here on the Linux Unplugged program that we have created and crafted just for you. If you've never listened to Linux Unplugged before, or if you've been listening for the entire 2015 year, there is something in this week's episode of the show. So thank you very much for tuning in. And while we're still in the intro, let's bring in that mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hello. 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 Happy holidays. Hello. Happy holidays, guys. Thank you for joining us. You know, we got something that came in on the mail. Came in, knock, knock on the door. Before we well, start, hello there. Before we started the show, we got a brand new package that came in and we thought, what the heck is it? Was it a Christmas gift? Was it a Kwanzaa gift? Surprise! And uh, I started, it's funny, the box actually said, tear it open. That's what the box says on the front of it. Tear, tear it into it. And I'm like, well, that's a challenge. All right. Yes, gonna, it is. So I began to rip the box open. I pulled it out, and something very orange emerged from that box. I think it's called the Cano, and we're going to talk about this. So the Cano appears to be a computer kit built for kids. Uh, it has a Raspberry Pi as its brain. And uh, Wes, we have it right here in studio. And I was thinking, you know, it comes with this keyboard. It comes with this nice acrylic case. It's got a touchpad. It's got all the cables you need. This is like if you wanted to give a Raspberry Pi to a kid, it comes with the stickers. Like this is legitimate, like very compelling for a kid. And the packaging is like Christmas ready. I mean, it's all you could ask for this as is a kid a for like a cool, fun tech gift. Seriously, this is like a Raspberry Pi for the holidays. It comes with a speaker so you can make it a podcast player or an MP3 player. It my parents with, have Windows 10 on the desktop, but I want my own system. It comes, Bam. Look at this. comes with the HDMI out, comes with the uh, USB wireless keyboard with oh. a touchpad. Yeah, it's got the wire there too. Look at this thing. Dang, son. I know. This is a and the Rubik's Cube, does it come with that? All right, uh, <laughs> all right, Wes. So here's the challenge. I want you to open this thing on the show live and give us your impressions of it, but don't ruin it in case I want to give it to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen, right, to none no, of your shows. No, I not, not yet, at least. Not yet. Maybe one day. So, uh, yeah, it looks like a pretty nice box. And, oh, Ooh. look at this. The box actually has an illustration on it. That's beautiful. It's got the Raspberry Pi uh, laid out. This is a really nicely done packaging for this thing. Oh, look at that. Okay. All right. It's a little nicer than I expected. Do you need anything to cut? Do you need I a... I do. Hmm. You got keys on you, Wes? No, I, you took your keys out I of your pocket. I took my keys out. Wes! I'm Wait, an amateur. Use this pen. Use, use this, this pen. pen. I could probably use cut it with pen. the Onion Omega over here. <laughs> Don't use the Onion Omega, Wes. Don't use the Onion Omega. This is really, this is really something. Uh, and their website is uh, us.kano.me. Oh, there that is Ooh. a premium lid. Wow, I wish we had the camera on for this episode. It is, I don't know how to describe this. Wes the is- smell oh. sublime. Let me see. Yeah, that does smell good. So uh, you open it up, it has a pouch on the roof of packets with a one, two, and then underneath it, it has- And this is all premium. I mean, it's like nice, heavy- Glossy matte paper. cardstock. Yeah, then down here, look at this poster. That here is they have super a, gloss. They have like a thick poster paper here. Nice foam with, insert. Keep, it says, keep this card. Uh, you've built your computer. Oh, my God. Okay, this this keyboard is amazing. Like, it's... This is... Uh, the keyboard is bright orange. It's wireless. It has a built-in trackpad. Uh, it is... It feels... This is really it seems like well a, done. I want that keyboard for just my own use. Look at that Raspberry Pi. Look at that in there. That is... This is... This is super neat. 
this is really well done. Uh, so here's the keyboard. Here's it's got an HDMI cable. What's this right here, Wes? Is that just USB there? That is a for charging. Yep, USB micro USB. And then here's the here's the speaker you can add on right there, which looks really nice. And what's what do you have there? What is that I red? Don't know what? Oh, is that a power? Oh adapter? yeah, it's a power adapter. Yep. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so you can power the Raspberry Pi. So this is everything you need but the screen to make the Raspberry Pi a full-fledged computer. Oh, and it comes computer. with here in a U.S. adapter. I assume if you buy it in other oh, markets, yeah. you could get the suitable power adapter. So for if US. you have a display that works with HDMI, this is everything you Which need. Which is what? Just about everything, everything these days. This is literally everything you need to make the Raspberry Pi a full-fledged computer. And then you put Ubuntu Mate on there, and you're good to go. Right? I mean, and this is like a whole sandbox. You can let your kid, your teen, like whatever, right? You, you can have wow. a whole separate thing. You don't break this it. This is, this, look at this keyboard. I mean, this is, that right there is really something. Uh, so they sent this into the studio, and uh, this is uh, remarkable. Yeah, Wes is smelling it right now. It has that mm. new computer smell, right? I love it. So it's Cano. The trackpad feels really nice. It comes with really easy books. I think this is gonna. I think this is gonna go under the Christmas tree this year. That is really cool. And you know, just a couple episodes ago, we were talking about these small computers. Wimpy, you might have yourself uh, a whole bunch of Ubuntu Mate computers under the Christmas tree this year if uh, if this takes off. This is really impressive. Is there an SD yeah, card in there too? Bad. Yeah. Are they Pi 1s or Pi 2s? I think it's a Pi 1, but I don't know. Oh, no, I take oh, it well. back. No, no, it is a Raspberry Pi 2. Excellent. It is a Raspberry Pi 2, and it comes with an SD card with the Cano. Look, it's a branded Ooh. SD card. With a cute guy with a nice little, like, bowl cut. Yeah, it, it's a nice, like, it, it's not like a, oh, wait a minute, Wes, look at that. It has micro SD in there. Pull that micro SD out. How big is that micro SD storage there? What does it say? Do you, can you see the space on there? Sand disk. You see the space on it. Eight there? gigs. So it comes with an eight gig micro SD but card. You, could, you know, if you already have, a, let's say, sixty-four gigabyte for your camera, etc., you just give that to your kid. He has a full thing. Holy crap! Oh, we should take a picture of that. That is a cute SD card. Yeah, they, re- they that is like they really put all the final nice touches on this. The keyboard is very high quality. Uh, the acrylic case is really really nice. It's really strong. Uh, it, co- it includes a USB wireless dongle. Look at this tiny USB wireless dongle. Whoa! Look at that. It includes that too. This is remarkable. This is going under the Christmas tree. This is really something, which is great. This is just great. And this seems like such a good gift for someone like you're an aunt or an uncle. And like you don't, maybe you don't see this kid oh, so man. much, but you know that they're kind of interested in this area. Oh, you don't have man. time to maybe spend with them all the yeah. time, but you just want to set them on the right path. That is really neat. That is something. Huh. You put, yeah. So there you go. There you go. That is pretty neat. We just a little live unboxing right here on the Unplugged Show. You know, uh, guys, one of the things that uh, was a big topic this year that was something that was fun. We talked about it as a, here is a crowdfunding project. It started as like, I think it was Indiegogo, I don't recall. Starts as an Indiegogo, becomes a key point to developing applications for the GNOME desktop. The guy gets a job at Red Hat now, and now it's part of like the XGD app spec to make portable applications for the Linux desktop. I'm talking about GNOME Builder, and we discussed GNOME Builder on episode 76 of the Unplugged program. Uh, Matt, I'm going to try giving uh, a guest a call. Let's see if... Uh, see right. if hey, Christian, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you great. Sure Thanks can. for coming on the show. So, Matt, this is uh, Christian. He's working on GNOME Builder. And awesome. you're probably familiar. We've talked about the Indiegogo project that's going on. Christian, welcome to Linux Unplugged. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, no problem. So, uh, congratulations, by the way, on the success of the GNOME Builder uh, project. That seems like that's that Indiegogo has probably gone better than you expected, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, significantly better than I expected. I, I tried to set some, some pretty ambitious goals, but at a very, very reasonable price point. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that people saw that and, and really came out to help. Well, what struck me about it is, uh, is you seem like maybe you're a crazy person because you quit your full-time job to do this. Uh, why take that risk? And you did that even before you launched the fundraiser. Yeah, you know, I've been I've been a part of the free software community for a long time, and and uh, at some point, I just I decided that fixing the tools that we're all using is far more important than individual career growth to me. So I had a pretty kick-ass job too. I was working at MongoDB, working on their C driver, and it's a great group of people there. They really care about free software. There's a reason why the product's AGPL licensed. But ultimately, this this was the most important thing I could be doing. So I, I really had to make the switch. That's very impressive and, and very I mean very admirable. Uh, so when you launched the uh, fundraiser, 
Has has the scope of what Gnome Builder is going to include uh, expanded quite a bit since the uh, funding kicked in? Well, you know, it, it really determines how much, you know, and for how long people are willing to support me. Like, uh, yes, I wanted, I want all of these features in there. Um, you know, I knew that for me to be able to be successful this, with this, the most important thing I can do is build Builder with Builder. So that meant the first priority is C. And so we need C... Builder has to be written in C for technical reasons. We want to reuse as much of the software as we can. We want to reuse Glade. We want to reuse DevHelp. We want to reuse Git G, um, GTK Source View, and all these things are best integrated from C. So that didn't mean that we don't want to support Vala. You know, it doesn't mean we don't want to support Python or JavaScript or any of these other languages in a first-class way. It just means that like our priority had to be this first. So I knew that a lot of people would really care about those languages, and I really want to support them. It just, you know, it's it can't be the first thing to be done. We can't, you know, put the cart before the horse. Right. That makes sense. I mean, focusing like that means that you get that right, and then once you get that right, you move on from there. It, it, but this looks this looks like maybe, is it going to become a general IDE for GNOME eventually, like all kinds of languages in there, all kinds of support? I mean, th- that is certainly my goal. I, I, you know, I don't care what language you write GNOME software in. And most of us don't. So anything I can do to bring more people in and more people contributing, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that. You know, we already have basic support for some of these languages. You already get, like, air reporting for Vala. You already get air reporting for Go if you have, a, like, a working mm. Go setup. Mm. So, you know, it, even beyond GNOME, someday that, that's quite possible. But I definitely want to stay focused myself on, like, how do we build GNOME software better? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and I, it seems like this would be a great tool for when somebody asks the question, where do I get started? People can say, okay, get started with Builder and go from there, which is is such a, it seems like such a simple thing to be able to say, but we have lacked that one coherent answer for so long that I've talked to a lot of developers who've been put off by that. It just seems like there's so many choices. And this represents, well, if you're going to go GNOME, if you're going to do GTK, start here. Now, that itself is a huge goal. And so I'm pretty impressed that you've raised $42,000. But what happens six, seven, eight months from now? This is your full-time job. That funding sort of begins to wane. How do you, yeah. can, how do you make it ongoing? What, what's the trick there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, the, I think a really important thing is to, to, number one, build a really strong community. So we can all share the burden. But on, on the point that you mentioned there of having like a single answer to tell people, like that is, that is really, really important. For my time spending like helping people get started in free software, almost always the first question is, how do I get started? And it's a really monumental thing to get over. And you look at something like Android or whatever, you know, they have an IDE that you install, and there's, there's other choices, but there's, there's a, a blessed sort of way. And you enable developer mode on your phone. I'd really like to see that in terms of GNOME, you know, where you're just able to enable developer mode in the control settings, and then all of a sudden you have a, a complete development environment, and everything else is taken uh, is is done underneath the hood, and you don't have to worry about it. So, would your would a goal of yours be maybe to have Builder almost kind of considered a part of of a, of a GNOME desktop, maybe like in developer mode, where it's can, almost under the branch of GNOME? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is I think, I, I, I've contributed. I think it's just a great project initiative. And we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, so, Christian, uh, you, I guess you're already working now. So does anything change for you now that this is successful, or are you just plowing on forward? Well, you know, the, the last couple of weeks I've been so busy with, with uh, you know, fundraising and, and communicating with people. And, and so the amount of code I've gotten written in, in January is significantly less than all of the other months. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really looking forward to just, you know, putting the blinders on and writing code again. Yeah, absolutely. Gnome Builder has seen a lot of attention since we covered it in uh, episode 76. And Wes, do you have any thoughts on it since, uh, since that episode? Now, here we are at the end of the year. Only that I'm really excited for the future of a nice Gnome native Python IDE. Yeah. You know, I mean, I use, I use Vim pretty much for everything. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of my coworkers, they, they're using Sublime, they're using Atom, Visual Code. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of options these days. Mm-hmm. And... I think GNOME needs something. And I think Python is used by, you know, it's installed by default. In a lot of places, GNOME is installed by default. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm excited in this new year to try out GNOME Builder. There you go. And I I think what I'm excited about it is that it's given a lot of people like, hey, I want to create a desktop application. I want to use GTK. Something to target. What's my entrance path? Exactly. Yeah, I do like that quite a bit. All right. Now, I want to move forward to something that was very exciting, very fun for us. On episode 79 this year, 
It was the episode we did right before the new BQ phone actually went on sale. Popey joined us and he went in depth on some of the stuff around it and we just had a great discussion around the new launch and what people should expect. About what we're all really here gathered today to talk about and uh, that's this new BQ phone uh, that goes on sale next week. Uh, it's like around 170, uh, I think, what is it? Like probably like 100, I don't know, about $175. I don't know what it's going for exactly US. Uh, and... Um, there's even a little video. Now, I don't think there's a lot of words in this video, so I'll just I'll just put it up on the stream so we can look at it. I mean, it's a, it's definitely a very fancy video. After all of the waiting, I mean, it, it I know it's only been a couple of years, but it feels, I mean, that's a long time. In the scheme of developing something like this, that's not actually a long time, but for right. people sitting on the outside, it feels like a long time. Uh, and so this is this video is extremely well done. I, Pope, I don't know if, do you know any of the background on this video? Like, this no, is... the first time I saw it was uh, last Friday. I'd, it was uh, it was shown off at uh, an event in London, and I'd never seen it before. And actually, that's uh, the bits where you see outside the guy on top of a building is actually on top of our office building. Um, you can, I can recognize certain, you know, parts of oh, London that's funny. in uh, in the video. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and we will have the video linked in the show notes. I think one of the things the video does really well for me is it it's essentially without being uh, too obvious about it, showing me. You know, kind of how Ubuntu Touch would sort of fit in with like the ideal daily lifestyle that, of course, nobody truly lives. But if you live that, like, it, I, I get like contextual information becomes available to me just by watching that commercial. Like, it's surprisingly effective. Life at your fingertips is the slogan. That's pretty good. This is really like well it, done. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think they did a nice job with it. I think it's going to be interesting to see where it goes to. So the Aquarius E4.5, 4.5 inch screen, huh? Well, so there you go. So the BQ phone, it's not like it's not a screamer of a phone. It's not going to blow you away with its stats. Uh, it's got a 4.5 inch screen. Uh, runs at uh, 540 by 960 resolution. 1.3 gigahertz quad core ARM Cortex A7 MediaTek CPU. A Mali 400 GPU at 500 megahertz again MediaTek. 8 gigabyte EMC storage. 1 gigabyte of RAM. 2150 milliamp battery. Dual micro SIM and an 8 megapixel rear shooter. Uh, as far as first goes, it's not bad, especially if you consider that, you know, for a certain sector of the market, that's plenty of phone. I don't oh, yeah. It, I, don't oh, yeah. For me, but. I think anyone coming into the smartphone space for the first time is going to be pleasantly surprised. And I think that's really where they're going to hit their sweet spot. Now, that's where I would target. And I think that seems like that's what they're doing. Now, it's not launching in the U.S. yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. it is available. It'll be mm -hmm. available. I wonder, I wonder if I'll still be able to buy it. I don't know. So <laughs> the... Uh, the uh, the event that happened last uh, Friday, there were thirty people invited from is, this is the insiders event? around the world. Quote unquote. Yeah, it was called the yeah the insiders event. The Ubuntu insiders. They were actually invited uh, a couple of months ago. We built a list of people that we thought might be interesting to come along and and see it. And there was a couple of journalists, a couple of video bloggers, um, and some. Um, some like blogger bloggers like written bloggers and um members of our community developers and what you might call outsiders uh, from the community um just to come along and we give them a phone and they get to be the the first people with one of these devices we also gave them a few little tidbits of information over the over the month leading up to it uh, and then we flew them out to London on uh, on Friday, and they uh, they came and saw the uh, that video and a couple of talks by uh, there was a guy from BQ there. There was uh, a couple of people from Canonical giving talks. Um, it was really good fun. Had a and, few beers, and they they got to leave with a phone, right? Yeah, we gave them all the phone, uh, and uh, it was in a special presenta yeah. origami presentation box. Um, there was a phone yeah. and a, uh, a pair of nice headphones. Yeah, and it even um, it even warranted uh, the Ubuntu phone's first official unboxing video, which OMG Ubuntu picked up and ran. That Ubuntu yeah. phone box is slick. I gotta say, that's a nice was, looking box. Yeah. It was funny. The um, the, we were asking them, look, do you mind if we video you um, opening? Because we, you know, we know what it's like. You know, people yeah. want to see the thing unboxed. Yeah. Yeah. And so the video that you're showing now of um, that's Jordan Keys uh, unboxing yeah. his uh, his. He actually ran back to his hotel room <laughs> or ran back to another room in order to <laughs> to do that. And then we went out for beer in the evening while his video was rendering out. And then he uploaded it to YouTube when he got back after a few beers. Good sport. So, um, good yeah, sport. It was, it was it was a good it was a good day. Um, I noticed and, too. I noticed that they come with a uh, uh, the uh, the Insiders Edition came with a very nice set of just headphones, like an extra perk there. That's really cool. 
Yeah, yeah, we wanted to give them a little bit of something extra to say thank you for taking part and, uh, and you know, uh, coming all the way to the UK. I mean, some of them flew over, some of them didn't have fast come, but uh, it was nice of them to come over and just take part and uh, and give us feedback as well. You know, we've been capturing feedback from them. It, it, you know, I, I was walking around on the Friday with a notebook, old style paper notebook, and <laughs> right people were saying, hey, Popey, what about this? And how does that work? And why is this like this? And I was making lists and, you know, I've been giving feedback to developers and filing bugs, like, you know, doing all the due diligence because these are the first people that have seen them outside Canonical. We've all seen it evolve. You know, I've had one of those phones since August last year and oh, wow. I use it every day, but there are things you just don't notice. And then when someone walks up mm. to you and goes, oh, why, why is it doing, allowing me to do this? And you think, oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, it's just something because you use it every day. You just don't think that's yep, weird. Very you much. shouldn't do that. Yeah, very much so. That is very true. So, so actually they, they go on sale as a flash sale starting tomorrow, which is Wednesday, the 11th of February at 8 uh, eight o'clock UTC, so it's nine central and if, so European time. Flash sale means only gonna be available for a limited time. Are suckers like me? Are, are we gonna be able to buy it, or is it only gonna be? A, is it region it's locked? It's all you know? day, so it's nine nine central uh, European time till six central, so eight till five UTC. Um, so yeah, it's a fairly lengthy amount of time throughout the day. It's not like, you know, a 10 minute flash sale. It's not like yeah, the whole right, car, yeah, yeah. world has to DDoS so I might actually website for the day. I'm, I'm, uh, you could try. I have a shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm certainly going to bed early so I can get up. It's like Christmas for me tomorrow because I'm going to be ordering one, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're all going to be ordering them. Are you pretty excited? Yeah. It's, it's you know, the fact that, that, you know, I started working at Canonical three years ago knowing that this was going to happen and it's taken a long time for us to get here. And we've, you know, we've had a lot of flack along the way and the method by which we've developed this and the software choices that we've made and the, the hardware specification of the first device. You know, this remember, this is the first Ubuntu phone. Right. Uh, hopefully one of many devices. You know, if we come back on um, Unplugged episode 600, there'll be, you know, a plethora of these sure. phones out there. Sure. Who knows? You know, Are you just already know. looking at the next device a little bit? Because I know they... Yeah, yeah, we've already said the next one is the Meizu. Yeah. Yeah, MX4. that one's going to be a little more uh, like a larger screen, right? One thing, and uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's quite a bigger screen and more. It's uh, more cores, more RAM, yeah. you know, yeah. more and bigger of everything. But um, yeah, you, the moment you start we're just somewhere, totally focused on the PQ. One. How how important was it? Uh, you know, you mentioned that you've had one iteration of this or another since August. Is that part of why you know you got to start and you kind of have to lock in the specs at some place and then start developing for that? And so uh, this the BQ phone, yeah, it's it's sort of been locked in for a while i take it right and so we initially were you know we've had loads of different hardware over the the time that we've developed this we started off with a tablet edition on an asus transformer mm. tf 101 yeah. and we've moved through very uh, nokia n9 and various samsung galaxies and nexus devices and you know then we got a partner in bq so we we grabbed a bunch of those devices and we started doing the hardware enablement and making sure all the apps work because you know if we've been focusing on the nexus 4 then we discover that oh actually certain dialogues don't fit yeah. on the screen because i was wondering the, about yeah, this yeah. thing's slightly different Different. So, yeah. so we have to make sure all our apps and the dash is responsive and, you know, scales down to, to devices of this size. And it's actually made us more disciplined. Having a device that has more constrained hardware resources is probably better for us. If mm. we'd have had the MX4 first mm. and had, you know, octo core with two gig of RAM, right. we could have gone nuts and, you know, made yeah. some decisions that actually we'd regret later because we'd have to try and scale it back. Whereas, from what I'm told, um, even unoptimized on the MX4, it flies along. I haven't actually got one myself, Ooh, yeah. uh, but I'm told it flies along. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty good on this BQ device and we've still got some more optimization to do. Um, so yeah, there's still work and we're still ongoing. And, and the good thing is that we continue to deliver updates to that device. So even when we've moved on to the, to the, MX4 and the next device and the next device, all the previous devices continue to get those updates. God, the MX4 looks so sweet. Wow. This looks like a, yeah, yeah. I mean, I want the BQ just to have the experience, but I think the one right. I'm going to land on would be the MX4. This is an incredible phone. I want them all. Yeah, well, sure, of course. <laughs> it's like trading cards, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'd like yeah. it. So Collect how all, how uh, how much how much energy do you do you suspect Canonical will put into uh, 
sort of like, I don't want to know if a generic image is the right one, but an image that's essentially with some modifications that'll work on most smartphones. Is that something Canonical well, will ever you can't, do? You can't really do that yeah. because the ARM architecture doesn't so let different. you. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things. You know, ARM doesn't really have the concept that the PC world has in terms of ACPI and device discovery. You know, that's that that's very mature on the PC and you can have one code base, stick a, a USB stick in it and it will boot, auto discover everything and figure out what drivers to load at runtime. Um, and the second problem is most um, SOCs, most of the chips that are in phones have uh, binary blobs and you know that's that's sad and disappointing and but that's just the world we we live in right yeah. now there are no free soft fully free software phones none none whatsoever so whenever anyone complains at us that we're not a fully free software phone well good luck finding one well yeah if you um, want to if you want a phone that just makes phone calls <laughs> right yeah or yeah. is usable yeah. in any way shape or form yeah um so we you know we we have to build um, an image that is use, you know, usable on a specific device. But that's that's actually where we've been quite cunning with this is that we have multiple layers to the to the um, image that goes on the on the phone. There's the very base layer, which is the device specific part, and that's you know there'll be a device specific bit for BQ, a device specific bit for the MX4, and then and, ongoing and, and practically, other devices. what is that? Is that is that a specific kernel? What what is that yeah. layer composed of? Yeah, so that's the that's effectively the kernel and the drivers for things like the GPU, the okay. radios, okay. and all that. The sensors, you know. So, so for example, if a device comes along that has a fingerprint sensor, just for the sake of argument, you know, we might want to support that, and that would be a device specific thing driver yeah. that would need to go in. Right. But okay. on top of that is the second layer, which is the user space bit, which has got all of our Ubuntu stuff in and the dash, and then on top of that is your apps, but also the the OEM or the carrier. Um, can put their own additional bit on top. So, so we control a bit in the middle. That's that's the um, the app the the APIs Ubuntu and all stack. the all the stuff people write. Yeah, towards. and the dash and the common bit that you would see across all the devices. The bit at the bottom is the device enablement, and so that means that when a new device comes out, all we need to do is do the device enablement, and then it's the same user space that runs on those. And so when a, when when we want to update an old device, we just update the middle section, and the device enablement bit stays the same. That's a really good approach, and you can it means, see it means we don't have that fragmentation that that Android has. We have, you know, we can have lots of different devices on the market, and they're all effectively running the same code. Well, and it seems like it's approachable by just a, you know, a fairly well organized community could come together and say, "All right, well, we'll take on supporting the Nexus Four for another couple of years, or we'll make a Nexus Five port." And me, as a more sophisticated user, could say, "You know what? I know this community. I'll go use their image because." If I'm following you, the only thing they would really have to modify would be that first layer, that, that lower level bits, right? Right. And so someone has already created the Nexus 5 right. port, yeah, as you yeah. know. Yes. And, you know, it has issues. It's not perfect hardware-wise. We're going to continue to maintain the Nexus 4, Nexus 7, and Nexus 10. And then what other, wherever other devices come along that we have to support, you know, for uh, contractual agreement for things like BQ and Meizu and, and, and so on. Um, so we'll continue to maintain you know, a whole bunch of devices going uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Hmm. All right, I got a couple more questions, uh, and then uh, and then we'll open up the moment. Now here we are at the end of the year, and it's been very interesting. Popey joins us. Hey, Popey. So, what are your thoughts now? A little bit after launch of the first phone, and sort of looking back on all of that. So, at the time when you know before it before it was announced and before it was released, we really had no idea how many people would buy one, and you know whether whether they would all get sent back or you know whether people would keep them or continue and right. develop software with it. You know, we just didn't know what people would do, and it turns out that you know now, however many months later, what is it now? Eight months later, yeah. uh, we're still pushing out images updates every six weeks uh in fact we're doing a, an extra one just before christmas i think it'll probably land on phones like a few days before christmas with some uh you know hot fix updates but um people are still using it they're still using it for developing apps uh they're some people are using it as their daily driver you know not a huge number of people but we didn't expect you know we weren't expecting millions of people to buy them but mm -hmm. what surprised us was BQ were so impressed with the sales figures that hmm. they wanted to sell another one and then they wanted to sell another one. And so next year there's going to be more phones from BQ. That's a big deal. That's really result exciting. Of 
how successful it was this year, which is great because, you know, that's validation that we're doing something right if our, one of our partners actually says to us, yeah, we want to make more of them. So, yeah, it's been a Absolutely. good year. Yeah, that is, that, is a, that is probably the best benchmark to go by right there. Uh, great point. So one of the things that I got a lot of crap for this year, and I feel like it maybe it was a little undeserved looking back at it, but I, maybe it wasn't, I don't know, but I went on a rampage against ButterFS. I, in episode, uh, let's we'll see, what was it, uh, I think 87, looking back on it, I think I declared it a clown file system. Okay, so I had a real rough day. Uh, I came in. Uh, and uh, I could not uh, get my computer to start. I sat down at my desk, turned on the nice Asus monitor that I am quite proud of acquiring. I stare at a screen, and it's nothing but errors, Matt. Nothing oh, but errors. No. And if you're watching the video version of the Unplugged program, I'm going to pull those errors up on my screen right now. It was devastating. It starts as this. Booting the Linux kernel. Starting version 2.18. Oh, well, yeah, you know what that is. And then, hold on a second... Info, task mount 175, blocked for more than 120 seconds. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Task butter FS transaction 197, blocked for more than 120 seconds. Uh-oh. And that's all it ever did. And then I now, now of course, so here's Chris's, here's Chris's conundrum. Chris has a show he has to go to, and he needs a computer <laughs> right now. Like, I do not have really, like, so my so, so here's what runs through my head when my most important computer doesn't boot. I think to myself, well, I should go grab a live USB stick and probably boot in there and see if I can get the main OS up and just, you know, maybe true in there and get everything I need and then fix it later. Like, I'm starting thinking, like, maybe I could, like, zombify this thing and, like, prop it up and, like, get in there and get my work done for the day and then, like, get out before the whole thing collapses out from underneath me. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so I'm starting to think, okay, what are my other options? Well, I had just the night before installed um, Ubuntu Mate 15.04 uh, Beta 2, I think it is right now. I think that's the current one. That's nice. right. Yes. And, uh, and so I had a USB stick already flashed. I love, you know what, also, props to Ubuntu Mate. Um, really, I, I think the only distro when you just go to their website and the download links and, they, and, and you put DD Rescue up there, the command to run. And you just make it real clear. Use DD Rescue to write this to an ISO to a thumb drive. Everybody else always recommends DD. And a lot of times, they don't just clearly put the command right there above the download links. It makes it so clear. And the fact that you also update the name of the ISO image, so you literally could just copy that whole command, is, is, is just brilliant. It is so helpful because I myself always end up using DD, and I forget to use DD Rescue, which is way better to write an ISO f file to a flash drive. So anyways... Props to Mate. So I had this thumbstick ready to go, and I needed to get working right here, right now. So I stick the Ubuntu Mate 1504 USB thumb drive into my rig, I reboot, and I get into the desktop environment. It's pretty snappy. In fact, it's unbelievably snappy. It's so fast that I was I was grousing to Rikai, who was standing over me because I'm, you know, he's he's trying to console me as I'm in, as I'm as I'm. Uh, as I have been mortally wounded, and I'm si and, and 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 this gray screen comes up, and I start grousing. Oh man, now I gotta wait for the fancy grub screen to render because because this monitor's so large that anytime there's a big graphical grub screen comes up, it slowly paints onto my screen, and I'm, I'm sitting here grousing about that. And what I realized was that, that actually wasn't the case at all. It I, what I thought was the grub screen was actually X11 starting. It had booted so fast that I thought I was waiting for Grub, but I was actually waiting for the entire <laughs> desktop. It was amazing. It boots so fast. It was so cool. So I was like, all right, install. <laughs> I'm like, after that, I'm like, that's it. That's all I needed. I just needed my computer to be really fast, and I just want to get back to work as fast as possible. I've got to do some clipping. And so I, I installed Ubuntu Mate on my main workstation. This is my rig up in my office. And uh, I used it for a couple of days, a day. I think I used it for a day, actually. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a couple of issues. First of all, I'm just I'm here's the here's the thing you don't want to do. It, it's not really a great idea to use a beta version on your main workstation because no. so many of the PPAs out there don't work with it. They they expect you to be on a released version of Ubuntu. So as soon as you start setting up PPAs for like themes or like a calendar widget or whatever, you just start getting 404s in your app get update like an animal constantly. It's just a horrible mess. And then you end up, like, you know, having to go out there and pull some of them out. So that was a bit disappointing. And things like Telegram not working sort of were 
deal breakers for me. And I ended up going back with Antigros because it was uh, it was so early in the process I could jump back. Uh, so now I'm sort of at square square zero and sort of setting up and trying to get advice from the audience on what should I try? Because I haven't set this machine up in about a year and a half. So what would you try at this point? And I've already got some base stuff on there. But I have to say, uh, it was pretty slick. So here's so a couple of things I did in Ubuntu Mate 15.04 is I used uh, Ubuntu, or I'm sorry, uh, Mate Tweak to um, turn on Compass and to set my style so it had like a more of a bar layout that I liked quite a bit. And that was really, really easy to set up. Really slick. Uh, I, I decided I opted to use the new Mate menu uh, and I was pleased to see that Super Key activated that. So I was all really good. So the, the main problems I ran into with the mate menu were like sometimes when I hit the Super Key, it would pop up behind other windows. So when I would type, I couldn't see the results. And sometimes it was a little delayed in popping up. So I'd probably still, if I was going to stick with that desktop, I would probably use a dedicated launcher like Synapse or Gnome Do or whatever the hell. Uh, but uh, it's it's... <laughs> Such a nice setup. Like I, I was using that, and I could physically. I just felt my computer was like it felt like it was running faster, and I, I really was impressed by that. So Ubuntu Mate Edition fifteen oh four is looking really sharp. I ended up keeping it on the computer I'm setting up for my son, so he'll be running that for a while. And uh, I'm now running Antigros with GNOME three on uh, my main office workstation, and it was tough. It was tough. It was really tough. Now, did anybody catch that error message? And maybe what was the problem? Yep. Oh, you did, Poppy? Yeah, so um, how long did you leave it after the four minutes <laughs> and that, the, that error uh, message I, coming no, out? I actually left it all overnight. And it like just, that, yeah, overnight? Yeah, and it just kept repeating the same message. Interesting. Yeah. So my home server running ButterFS does that now and again, and all I do, uh, but that's after it's booted, like, and it's fine, and it's up. I just SSH in an echo zero as it says, and then I never see that error message again, because uh, it's only an informational message to say, yeah. holy crap, there's a yeah. truckload of I.O. going on well, right now. Well, uh, here's what you I know, think it is. Busy. I think Blackout24 is calling it right now in the IRC, and I think Groove Chicken in our subreddit called it. Another ButterFS gotcha has been added to the gotcha wiki entry for ButterFS. <laughs> That's how I see it. Stable kernel versions 3.19.1 can cause a deadlock at mount time. That's one of the new gotchas uh, in the ButterFS. Nice. And I think this is exactly what happened to me. I think this is ex I think as I'm on a rolling release, you know, I'm on a rolling release. And they wanted the packages with systemd and ButterFS, right? What's that? And they want to do the packages with systemd and ButterFS. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so there are workarounds. So if I would have looked this up, there's workarounds. But you know what? This is what I came to. I am so effing done with effing butter FS. It is not even funny. So when I, I, I was like, you know what? I don't care that I can fix this. I'm going XFS. So what I decided to do is my boot partition, which is about 250 megabytes, is extended for. Everything else on the system is XFS. My, my root file system, my home partition, my editing partitions, my gaming, all XFS, only XFS. ButterFS is dead to me. This is the second system I have, to quote unquote, kind of soft loss to ButterFS. As in, I could have fixed it if I really effing wanted to. In the Bonobo's case, I would have had to format. And in this case, I would have had to do a workaround for the timeout. And it's stupid. It's a clown file system. It's nowhere near ready, close to quality of ZFS. And XFS has a rich history behind it and probably has another 20 years left of development in it. So for my taste, I'm going XFS on everything that's important to me. My backend storage, I'm not even going to use a Linux file system. I'm going to use ZFS. I know. I kind of feel like I, maybe I'm the uh, one guy out here. But Wes, you were just saying uh, you're still a ButterFS fan. Yeah. You know, I have a RID1 set up at home. That's what my MB runs off of. That's kind of oh. my main data store. And Popey, you're still a maniac running ButterFS over there, aren't you? Yeah, I'm just, I, I'm just looking across at my little home server, chugging away there with, uh, I think, 12 disks in it, chugging away, still backing up all my stuff, hosting all my music. The and, scrubs come out know. clean. That's what's important. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, you, not, yeah not no, I, it's got to the point now where I don't even bother checking any of the cron mm -hmm. jobs because I know it's fine. It's yeah. just fine. All right, well, we'll check so, back in with you next year. Is, is that going to be how it's going to stay? Because uh, ZFS was was a preview in Ubuntu 15.10, and it's all gearing up mm -hmm. for officially being you right. know, unveiled for 16.04. Right. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I think ZFS So that's going to be tricky. Win. That tune's going to change? Is I, that what I, you're yeah, saying? When 16.04... <laughs> when 16.04 comes out, I'll certainly look at it, but I'm, I'm not going to migrate because, you know, I, yeah. I don't want to try one of these untested, you know, brand new <laughs> file systems right. that... <laughs> 
And you know, to be fair, uh, BSD isn't actually used at scale, so it hasn't really been truly tested yet. Hey, oh, right. oh, oh yeah. yikes! And that, and that Solaris that they took it from—that's that's nobody yeah. ever used that. Nobody ever. That's used not that. professional. Who? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking of uh, things that we can barely remember, uh, there was one little controversy that the Unplug Show kind of found itself in the middle of, uh, and that was the name change for Sol OS or. Solus, but don't call it Solus OS because, well, that could get them in trouble. Don't call it Evolve OS anymore. No, sir, no, sir. The project name has changed to avoid unnecessary legal action. Good boy. So uh, we have Ike and uh, Ryan here. Ike, do you want to uh, tell us what happened then? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was a fun week. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've really loved how this has really gone. So on April Fool's Day, of all days, um, I basically got an email come through and it said that I was getting a letter coming through as well, which is like, okay, this is just pure lulls. So I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I ended up phoning up the people involved, you know, independently, finding the, the, the phone number for this place separately. And it actually does check out. So I was like, ah. Um, uh -oh. So... Yeah, so the trademark is uh, is very, very much uh, specific to the UK. So uh, a couple of months ago, we were having problems with people, a uh, completely unrelated incident, by the way, but we were having problems with people, you know, trying to assert ownership over the brand. Um, so I took a couple of steps and I basically went ahead and put in a trademark application, um, not to be a patent troll, but just to stop people trying to pull one over on the project. So that was like, so in the UK, that happens for a couple of months and it's put up so people can, you know, they can object to it and say, hey, we own that, which someone did. And it's held by the Secretary of State in the UK and they own the trademark for OS, um, which I did not see coming. Wow. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Really? So, wow. I, mean, I could understand if it was Evolve. Like when I was reading through the letter, I was looking for the word Evolve. But no, it was for OS. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, That's... So, yeah, I mean, that absolutely and utterly sucks. So it's like, you know, that's one thing that Linux projects have traditionally done to to avoid that kind of thing, um, like have a suffix of OS or Linux or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, that absolutely and utterly sucks. So we went through on Google Plus for a couple of, well, I think it was about two days, asking for suggestions, doing on IRC, and, you know, we got absolutely nowhere with a, with a fitting name. So I just went back to a name that we've used before, which was Solus, but without the OS part. It's interesting to follow that project. And now, of course, here we are. They've shipped their uh, early versions, and uh, we've even done a review. And uh, I was kind of curious, Popey, on your thoughts now, kind of looking back towards the end of the year on this kind of yeah, situation. Yeah, I, I, I looked at this and I thought, oh, it's yet another distro. Who needs that? And uh, They're doing know, their own desktop. Bit, it's weird. Yeah. We don't know anything guy, about that. You know, <laughs> and he's... And he's barely getting all these builds done in time. But now when you look at it and he's got this stonking great Intel server in his flat that he's doing all his builds on and he's churning out loads of social media posts with screenshots all the time and boot times and, you know, the, um, the now, policy. There seems to be genuine community interest as well. Yeah, it's it's nice to see someone who who is strongly opinionated about what he wants from his distro yeah. and is, you know, driving it the way he wants to do, mm -hmm. you know, and it, you know, he listens to input from others and he he's got a community of people who are contributing as well. But, you know, he's going for it and I I wish him every success. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think it's uh, I think that's well put. And uh, the first early releases of it and like the one we we reviewed are actually surprisingly impressive. And I don't mean to be diminutive when I say surprising, but it's just what they have to work with and some of the challenges they've had to face. It's a whole lot of fresh energy in the ecosystem. It's kind yeah. of what it feels like. Yeah. Maybe it's not the direction right. everyone wants, but it's like right. that's a lot of effort put in yeah. and that can only have good you know, consequences. It's the first new truly independent distribution for a long, long time. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the interest around the project. Yeah, right. It's built from scratch and it really is something unique. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you know, as somebody who on this show specifically has talked a lot about Firefox versus Chrome. You never. Me, I know. I, I didn't know quite. It was very incongruent for me. I didn't know what to make out of this story. Do you remember when a Debian package manager, a maintainer over at Debian, found out that Chrome was downloading a binary in the background and enabling our microphones? 
Yes, I do. We had a good conversation around that. And and then it went into a much wider conversation that I thought was really interesting. Okay, so anybody want to jump in first on this Chrome topic? Uh, to me, it seems like this is a line too far. Uh, and here's, I, I already told this story, so I'll keep it brief, but I, here's what made me realize this. Um, let's see, uh, it was uh, Father's Day. I was seeing family, and uh, this family, it was a couple, they have two S4, uh, Samsung S4 phones. You know, a couple years old now because the S6 is out, right? And and before they before they installed this update they got, they wanted to come see me. So I look at their update. Oh, it's Lollipop. Oh, good. You guys are going to get Lollipop. Great, great. Yeah, this is a good update. You're really going to like Lollipop. Let's do it. Install it. So we plug in their chargers. We hit the update. It takes like an hour because it's got to update all their apps too. <laughs> it says it's going to take 30 minutes. <laughs> it does not take 30 minutes. And it updates all their apps. Well, one of the new apps it gives them is Google Photos. Oh, okay, Google Photos. All right, cool. So I'm showing them, well, I've got Google Photos on my on my phone. Let me show it to you. And I bust it down. I'm like, this right here is Google Photos, and it is so great. And I do not have time to tag and organize my photos, and I don't ever manage it. And this just automatically backs them up to Google servers for me and unlimited storage. And I'm just going into the whole thing, talking about how great it is. And look at this, I say. And I bust out the search feature, and I'm like, it's tagged every person's face. And look, this is it knows this is food, these are flowers, that's an object, that's a car, that's a whatever, a holiday. Like, it's gone through and figured all this stuff out. And I'm like, <clears throat> so check this out. And I hit the search button, and I say, show me all the pictures of my son Dylan at Christmas. And I'm like, and check this out. I've never tagged any of these photos. And the Google Photos app instantaneously, bop, 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 auto populates the search results. Here's all the pictures with Dylan at Christmas. <clears throat> And I'm like, isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? I never told it this is Christmas. I never told it this is Dylan. It just figured all that out by importing my pictures. And and they look at me like, like I am a crazy person. Like they look at me like, so how does it know that's Dylan? And I'm like, well, it, it looks at the face. So it knows the faces of everybody you take pictures of? Yeah. So it knows everybody you ever hang out with that's in your photos? Yeah. <clears throat> and I won't say this guy. Let's just call him. We'll just call him Jim. And they say to me, they say, well, what about your buddy Jim? He, he intentionally, like, it's his, per, it's his mission in life never to have a presence online. He never, he never wants to be tagged in any photos. He doesn't have a Facebook profile. He doesn't have a Twitter account. He doesn't have a Google account. Like, <clears throat> what about him? What about Jim? He's in some of your photos. I'm like, oh, yeah, Jim is in some of my photos. Like, so now Google knows that you hang out with Jim, even though Jim never wants to be online. I, yeah, I guess. And so I, I expected them to be like, oh, man, this is going to be so convenient. I, now I don't have to worry about managing my photos, and I don't have to worry about losing my photos when I get rid of my phone. But because they had never been introduced, and this is my, now, this is my, my theory, because they had not really been introduced to some of this Google stuff, <clears throat> they just were kind of all of a sudden thrown in on the deep end on one of the more kind of creepier things Google can do. And they weren't sort of slowly introduced to it. They didn't see it like be introduced through Google Plus and slowly develop with auto awesome features getting rolled out and like they didn't see the whole evolution of it. They just kind of went in, boom, and it, they're like, "Whoa, this is way too much!" And then now they're not going to use it. And then I thought, could I? Could you imagine if I told them that their Google web browser was automatically downloading a program in the background that turns on their microphone, so that time, so that way they can say, "Okay, Google, what's the weather like?" They would think I'm a crazy person. So when I think about it through their perspective, I think, gosh, maybe this has gone way too far. Maybe we are sitting here in the boiling pot just, ah, it's Googs. <clears throat> you know, they mean well. There's just one more thing, right? But hey, they fixed it, right? Now you can opt out. So <laughs> it's just no big deal. And we just keep on going. One more thing, one more. But every now and then I have like these reality checks where I talk to people outside the tech bubble and I expect them to be like, oh, man, that's great. And they're like, whoa, are you okay with that? Does Jim know you've done that? And I'm like, oh. And I, I felt like, geez, I, I, I didn't really think about that. Like, I had thought about it, but I didn't really, really, really wrap, wrap, wrap my head around it. And then this thing happens. So, Mumble Room, what do you think? Is this the line too far? Sean, I want to start with you. Go ahead. Well, bottom line is anything that can compromise my privacy, I want to be asked first before you add it to my stuff. <laughs> Good point. North Ranger, what do you think? I don't think we should be surprised because uh, we've seen this before with Android, uh, replacing gallery apps, camera apps with uh, the, the closed source uh, Google versions. 
Well, and that's actually what I was going to ask uh, Wimpy. And the value of this is negative. Uh, is this, once again, RMS being right, or are we overreacting? Is this what we get for using um, a proprietary browser by a advertising company that wants to make life more convenient? But Chromium's not a proprietary um, application, is it? No, but it still happened, didn't it? Yeah, and so... Um, it probably happened because this is how Chrome is packaged, how Chromium is packaged, because the two are very uh, closely related. But the question here is, is who is the package maintainer? Because if you're using a Linux distribution, ultimately you're placing your trust in the person that makes the binary packages that you install on your system. Because, as I said earlier, for a brief moment, for example, I'm a maintainer for Debian and for Arch Linux. So for a brief moment, I have root on your system. And the question is, do you trust me? And there are a lot of people out there that are in that position. Yeah. So, you know, there are um, processes in place with the distributions and they do things a little bit differently. I think uh, Debian is uh, far more rigorous than uh, some, uh, some of the other distributions in terms of the... Uh, checks and balances that are in place to ensure that the packages are of a suitable quality and they don't do anything, you know, untoward. Um, but yeah, you, you you take any distribution and ultimately you have to say to yourself, for a moment, somebody somewhere created this package and they have root on my system. That's a sobering thought and I think it's a good perspective for us to take because it is the reality and it's... Uh uh, it, 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 when you think of it in that context, in that perspective, you, you can see uh, why uh, there are other, other solutions being worked on. Um, and this is, yeah, exactly. And this is why things like, you know, Atomic and Snappy packages and Click packages are becoming a thing. Because, um, for example, on Android, when you install an app on your Android phone, that app during the install process does not have root. Hmm. Very good point. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, in a go-go, I want to give you a chance to say maybe Jim is uh, a lost cause that him and never having online presence is not possible in 2015. Should I not feel so bad? Well, it's kind of not possible because he could have walked past a shop that is sharing its CCTV camera with an app that you can download on the app store that lets you see CCTV cameras. Sure. So that then means it's been online. <laughs> That's it's true. quite hard to avoid <laughs> cameras in, nowadays. <laughs> isn't that all the internet. Yeah, isn't that so true? Um, so uh, here's what I wanted to kind of put out there is maybe a feeler. If you go to Linux Action Show to reddit.com, find episode 98 feedback thread. Um, what could I recommend them that they could put on a phone? It'd be great if it supported iOS and Android, so maybe I could use it myself, uh, that would work for backup. So I tried BitTorrent Sync. Eh, it'll copy file program files off, or pictures off. But it's, it's not the same thing to just copy the data as it is to actually have a little intelligence behind it. There's another app out there called Picture Life. This is a private company. They were recently bought up that does the same thing that Google Photos does privately. You pay more for it. I don't know. I actually forget. I, I just I was looking at it sort of casually. And uh, it automatically backups your photos, does the face tagging, does sort of like location tagging and tracking, but it's a separate private company. It's not part of an information behemoth. And that's kind of appealing, but I would really like an open source solution for photo backup. Uh, something where, you know, the user can let it run in the background, automatically copy the photos off, sort of like Google Photos does, or BitTorrent Sync, or Dropbox. Or actually, I think, I think there's even a way to do it with OwnCloud. I haven't... Yeah, okay, yeah, Mr. Grumpy R says, yeah, there is a way to do it with OwnCloud. I haven't really played with that. That might be worth playing with, but then see, they'd have to have an OwnCloud server. Yeah, that's a hard one. That is a hard one. I loved how we kind of made that transition from starting about Chrome and to get into the broader conversation. But before we go any further, I want to talk about something that's broad, and that's DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code Unplug to get a $10 credit, and then you can try out their $5 rig. Two months for free. Think about that. If you did that right now, you could try it out, and it would still be working in the future, in 2016, for free. Whoa! That's right. Use our promo code DOUnplugged over DigitalOcean.com, a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get a Linux rig up in the cloud, backed by KVM, using SSD, so that way the I.O. is super fast with crazy great connections in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Germany, and Toronto. Maybe you promised your niece a new Minecraft server? Spin it up. 
dude, maybe you, you maybe your New Year's resolution was start a new blog. Spin holy it up. smokes! Give the gift of Linux infrastructure. Exactly. Holy smokes! Use the promo code DO Unplugged. Actually, you know, I I have a Minecraft server. Uh, on do you really? I do. I have a sync thing server. I have a BitTorrent sync thing server. I got an own cloud server. I got a stun server up there. Uh, what else do I have up there? I have an MB server up there. I have a Quasal Core server up, a Quasal server up there. Um, of course, I have a web server that does a couple of just small tasks for me. Um, I have a GPG server up there. Uh, I got all kinds of stuff up there on DigitalOcean. It is really great. Their interface is very intuitive, very straightforward. They have a great API that pushes that all the way into your hands. Like you can just create a great script. There's a bunch of libraries that work with it or tons and tons and tons of community apps that are open source and ready to take advantage of. Really great, really great control panel, very reasonable cost, entire Linux infrastructure, HTML5 consoles to manage all of it. DO Unplugged is the promo code. DigitalOcean has been rocking support of this show for the entire 2015 year. And it would mean a lot to me if you went over there and used that promo code to keep our show going as a thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged show. So DO Unplugged, that's all you got to do. Try them out for two months. Absolutely free. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Unplugged show. DigitalOcean reminds me of the future, and something else that kind of felt like the future was our conversation around open source artificial intelligence and the Mycroft device. So in the pre-show, we were talking about uh, this uh, really cool Kickstarter called the Mycroft. And in between, literally in between uh, well, um, a few moments ago, and now since we started the show, uh, we've had somebody from the Kickstarter join us in the mumble room. I believe he's their chief technology officer. Uh, so I, I want to uh, bring him onto the show right now. Uh, Ryan, welcome to uh, Linux Unplugged. Welcome back, I should say. Yeah, it's good to be back. I love this show so much. Okay, so Ryan, in your own words, uh, what is the Mycroft device and um, what's your involvement with the project? So in my own words, have you ever wanted to walk into your house and have it be like you're on the Starship Enterprise? Yes, every day. Well, this project allows you to do that. It's oh. an artificial intelligence <laughs> for controlling your entire home from entertainment to your appliances, to your lights, to your music. Everything can run through Mycroft because it's powered by Linux. And how much of an infrastructure is there to, to just, like, if I'm a consumer, if I had something like this to set it up, put it on my table, am I, am I ready to start using it? Or is it like I have to write the apps for it? Absolutely. You, you do not have to write anything if you don't want to. That's actually a lot of questions I've gotten is, okay, it's open source. Drop the code on us right now. And we're like, no, mm. I, we want to, but we are putting in place ways to easily manage it and contribute to the project uh -huh. and 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 we before we ever started on this we actually this came out of a self selfish endeavor we wanted we had this place it's a maker space here in lawrence kansas and we wanted to power the whole place using an uh, artificial intelligence and so we went through all these different open source projects that were already out there you know this personal assistance type things and none of them did what we wanted. We wanted to control the lights. We wanted to be able to add new modules and, and essentially make it power the entire space. And everything was limited or really hard to install or really hard to configure. Mm. And we were like, this is not a good shape <laughs> for this to be in. I mean, we've already got things like Google Now and Siri and Echo coming out, and they're all super tied into their own ecosystems. Yeah. They're proprietary. And we were like, we, this is something open source can actually do better. Well, you know, and so the a big differentiator here, and, and maybe also the biggest question mark is it's running a local AI, a local AI that seems to be powering a lot of the recognition and and all of that. Is that is that all done locally? Is there no cloud component to this? There is a cloud component, okay. and uh, we've received a lot of questions about that. We use Pocket Sphinx for the keyword recognition. Pocket Sphinx is a local library that analyzes, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just listening for its keyword. Until then, you can say anything and it's not going anywhere. And that's good because you don't want everything you say in your house to be streamed up to a server. Right. So, it <laughs> just, so the, the voice processing for the trigger words is done locally. Yeah. But at that point, we actually send it off to a few different places. Mm -hmm. And essentially, whichever comes back first, we analyze it for quality, like how how accurate do we think this is? And then, you know, depending on how accurate that first speech to text thing is, and we have our own ways of kind of figuring that out, 
we either accept it or we wait for the next one to come in. And we're hoping that people will be able to make decisions for themselves, at least our technical users, for which which services they want to use for analyzing, you know, the queries and um, then go from there. The machine itself actually decides what to do with the query when it gets it back. So when it analyzes what you say, and this is really complicated, and I'm sorry, there's not really a great way to to encapsulate this into no, an it's actually easy fascinating. So the, the 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 decision, the action taken, isn't made up in the cloud service. It's the answer is provided to the local box, and that's where the decision is made on what to do. That's correct. That's correct. That's it comes nice. back. It comes back with a confidence. It says this is what we think it said, and then the the local machine goes through its modules very very quickly to decide which one applies to that. So if Chris Fisher says, I want you to play the Deadpool trailer on my TV in the living room, it's going to come back. It's going to look at the media module. The media module is going to say, I'm pretty sure he wants YouTube. Then the YouTube module is going to be activated, which is going to cast that to the, t- to the Chromecast in your living room TV. Sure. Huh. That, uh, that's pretty slick. And uh, I guess the nice thing here is if this re- re- really reaches its goal, uh, regardless of how well the device does, there could be a significant contribution by having this open source AI project. So can you tell me more about that? Like, is it a server client thing? Is it all open? Is there a, is there a proprietary aspect to it? What's going on with this AI and what's it called exactly? So the AI itself is called Mycroft. It's named after Mycroft Holmes, which is Sherlock Holmes' brother. It's also, hmm. uh, there's this book called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which has an artificial intelligence in it named Mycroft. And uh, Mycroft is important because uh, Mycroft, being Sherlock's home brother, was supposed to be super intelligent. He was supposed to be able to just, you know, he had an excellent memory, was able to just pull information out of his head at a moment's notice. And so that's where the inspiration came from for the name. The actual device itself is, is completely open. Open hardware, open software, and the entire unit and everything related to it is going to be open. The only thing I can imagine uh, maybe having some parts being held back would be some of our backend infrastructure for, um, you know, a not, like we we want everything that comes through uh, our servers to be encrypted and anonymized. Right. And so I don't know how much of our backend we're going to open source right mm-hmm. away. I being that I've your show actually was something that I grew with as I grew in my Linux abilities. I started listening to it probably. Oh God, like I don't want to guess how many years ago, but um, it, and so my goal is as a result of being kind of raised in this culture and having like a lot of my my um, tech knowledge grow with the open source community and my involvement in it. I would eventually like to get everything that we that we create open source but um there's also we we have to find the best way to do that and we have to do it at the right time or else people will be like this software is crap and so the uh, the way it interfaces with home automation devices uh is that through like the apis that those vendors provide like so uh smart things hub or, or philips hughes that's essentially it's just interfacing with those apis that exist out there already Yes, that's exactly right. Anything your Linux box can do, Mycroft can do because it's built on top of a Raspberry Pi. And so anything you can you can run on a Linux box, the way that the modules are created is it can just send off a command through, you know, through the Raspberry Pi to a device. How is and, uh, so how is that then um how is that done from the user? How is that set up from a user perspective in a, in a device that's all done with voice commands? Is there some sort of web interface, or how do you? I know it's getting down to the details. I'm just curious. How does an end user do interface with something like this? So there, there are two ways I see it. You, there's the for grandma, you know, and then there's for someone like Chris Fisher, <laughs> and grandma will use an application to install modules that others have created okay and then when they're installed like if she installs pandora it'll say on her on her phone or on her computer it will say Uh, you know log in okay we've imported your stations you know and then and then it'll say would you like to create custom names for these stations you know beyond their normal names so if you say play my jam it will go directly to the the station you've designated as my jam um but for chris fisher you might want to actually create a module that does something related to your studio over there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the, and the way that that works is 
is you can create a module and install it locally on your machine just by logging into your machine. And then if you want to contribute it back to the community, you can, and we'll have a community repo where people can contribute their own modules back. We, at the Makerspace, we have a whole bunch of drones and we fly them. And we've also got them so we can design flight paths for them. And so right now we're working on a module where we say, Mycroft, launch the drone to do a perimeter check. <laughs> oh, geez, and he amazing. goes on a predefined uh, flight path. And so, um, so that's the point, though, is I was getting very upset that I could get an Echo or, you know, one of these other devices in my house, but I would have no control over what right. services I yep. could use with it. Yeah. It'd be whatever Amazon told me I could use. And that's where I think the big difference is. People are like, I don't understand what's different. And it's like, well, if you get an Amazon Echo, Amazon is going to control every single thing that can interface with. There's that, there's that you know, they're going to, because they're proprietary, because they're this ecosystem that's going to put their own products and services ahead of others, you know, that's, that's something you don't run into with Mycroft because Mycroft is open and we're not going to prioritize anybody because frankly, we can't, you know, there's, people will be able to install whatever modules they want when we don't want to limit what they can install on their own device. $99,000, is that enough to build an open source artificial intelligence and manufacture and ship units like this out to customers? So that's a really good question. The $99,000, so we've already bankrolled this a lot. We, we come from a background of most of the people on the team, this isn't their first rodeo, There's, this isn't their first company. And uh, our CEO, Joshua Montgomery, has been featured in Ars Technica and a few other, you know, big online publications for his work on the Wicked Fiber um, initiative in Lawrence, Kansas, to get one gigabit, you know, internet service mm -hmm. to everybody mm -hmm. in the in the town. And so um, we've had we've had experience, and we all come from different backgrounds and maybe uh, in different companies that we've ha played a role in in starting and everything. What this says, $99,000, yes, will allow us to ship our first units. You know, that would be great. But it will also allow us to be able to have that reassurance that we're doing something that people want and we're ready to invest more in it because of that. You know, we, we think that, first off, we have a little bit of, you know, funds that we're willing to pour into the project mm -hmm. if we know that there's some actual uh, desire for a product like this. And secondly, if we actually do fund, that allows us to go to um, investors and say, hey, you know, we want to take this to the next level and here's the, yeah. here's the yeah. interest, you know, and everything. But I would love to see us get, I'd love to see us beat our Kickstarter goal and have enough, have enough resources to actually completely fund this from our fans, you know, and not have to go to um, investors if we don't have to. But I'm, but you know, we we've already planned for the next step in the event that we fund, and everybody will be able to get their unit and will be very in pretty decent shape for a good long time. So I would say, um, if something like this interests you head over there and back it. Yeah. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, hit us up. You can message us on Kickstarter. I'm in the chat, you know, occasionally, but you can also find me on Google Plus and Twitter at Ryan Lee Sipes and uh, just ask me a question. I had a chance to chat with Ryan at System76 when I went out there and they are extremely passionate about what they're trying to do. And they're, what I love about Ryan is he's really got a good handle on the big picture, the big picture of where they could take this thing. I don't know where that is yet, but man, like, you know, his example in our interview where he talked about they have Mycroft hooked up to a drone and they just say drone, you know, or they just say Mycroft, scan the premises and Mycroft launches a drone and it goes around and takes surveillance of the premises and gives them a report. Like That is amazing. Yes, that is. Like if like you're not feeling safe at home tonight, tell the Mycroft device to go out. And, and you can audit that, right? I mean, it's not just some drone that's watching everything and you have no idea how it's processing, right. where it's sending. The right. This is your drone. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and of course, you know, with all the other uh, commercial uh, artificial intelligence help out there, it's nice to have something that's open source and uh, something that uses code to locally listen uh, that we can trust. I want to shift gears now and talk about something that was a big revelation for Noah and I. We went down to LinuxCon, a.k.a. DockerCon, this year. And one of the things we walked away with was 
Docker and containers on Linux is really what the enterprise is talking about. But more so than that, how they can actually manage it once they've deployed hundreds of Docker containers, that they don't have such a handle on. Now, no, one of the things that jumped out at me about that talk, uh -huh. and they start, he's talking about security, is one of the main things that the vendors here are showcasing is how to patch your applications in containers. Like, people are, like, everybody has a different solution for that. Right. How to manage container security, yep. how to update applications in containers, how to know when the applications in the containers have gone behind, how to know when the application quits working. Yep. All of that is, um, like, I would say, and maybe do you, do you agree that like seems to be like the number one product that's being talked about here, the number oh, one yeah, problem? Well, I think so. I think so. The container technologies themselves, we have, uh, you know, we've built communities, and, and and there's already that the the standards exist for that, right? And so, what's left, where the market is, where there's left to to, to make a business or money is in products managing those things. Mm. Because like we're talking about, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the drive is you're not going to. Uh, nobody is going to manage that stuff from the command line, right? Even if it, even if it's possible, so you you need some sort of a solution, especially if you're doing it at a yeah, scale. Yeah, and the other thing is is uh, uh, containers kind of encourage you to have a lot of them mm -hmm. because not only is your density higher versus virtualization. So on right. a server that could have ten virtual machines, maybe you can now have twenty containers because you don't have the emulation overhead. But you also are kind of encouraged to do a container per application. So you put your mail server in a container and your web server in a container and your uh, you know your your group collaboration thing in it. You know, all these different things go in containers, all of a mm -hmm. sudden you have you have a dozen containers for one small office. And so one of the things that they're finding and talking about here is that container proliferation is just exploding. Yeah. And then even small shops have like all of these containers they have to manage. Right. And then the other thing they want to do is move them between services depending on which more cost effective. Now the next thing we're going to get into is a clip that perfectly demonstrates as commercial software moves into areas that more are more and more are more important to our daily lives, it is becoming more critical than ever that we as consumers can crack it open and take a look at it. I'm going to I think this next story and this clip and discussion we had perfectly demonstrates this. And not only does it demonstrate this, but it, we managed to also demonstrate why the discussion around DRM can still happen and it can have a new spin. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Linux Academy. This is a great resource for you to learn more about the technology and resources around Linux. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there, get our special discount, and learn more. It's a platform for learning more about all of the great technologies around Linux, no matter how much time you have. They have an avail availability planner. You go in there and say, i got time on Monday and Tuesdays and Fridays. And it will generate courseware that matches that. You go into the nugget sections. They have deep dives that last two minutes to six minutes. And then when you're really ready to immerse yourself, they have nearly 2,000 self-paced courses with instructor help available on demand, created by Linux enthusiasts and educators and developers. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Check it out. They have downloadable comprehensive study guides, seven plus distributions you can choose from, the entire AWS stack, Red Hat, OpenStack, graded server exercises, you hear that airplane out there, Wes? I sure do. You hear that airplane flying over? Those are people that are celebrating their successes by Linux Academy. They're just flying around in the Linux Academy jet. Okay, well, that's not true. But it might be true. It could be Santa's sleigh. Oh, which, you you know, it's got to be Linux-powered. <laughs> How else could it be so reliable? I agree. And you know what? When those rangers had to build a Linux-powered sled, do you know where they learned their Linux fundamentals? Linux Academy. Linux Academy. And they went to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged, and they got that reindeer discount. And you can, too. And you support this show. And, and it's seriously becoming very respected. You know, like you see someone, and mm -hmm. they've completed a lot of Linux Academy yeah. courses, you know that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. That is that is a very good point, is because they've been so focused on the content and on the infrastructure, on the course where they pick, and they manage to watch the industry and determine what stuff really matters, they've gotten a really good name for themselves. And that just pays dividends as a Linux Academy subscriber. So go to linuxacademy.com slash unplug, take advantage of our discount, and tell them you appreciate them supporting the show for all of 2015. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Thank you, Linux Academy. All right, so let's talk about this VW scandal where you hooked up the VW uh, cars to get tested and the computer software made things look a little better than they really were. And that is where the problem lies. Volkswagen cheated on emissions tests again, says the EPA. This time about 10,000 VW, Porsche, and Audi diesel engine cars are implicated. They're all installed with software that makes the cars emit less pollution during tests. When driving on real roads, the cars emit nine times the legal limit of nitrogen oxide. So this software, I'm going to stop it right there. This software 
is specifically designed by Volkswagen that when it is in test mode, it alters the way the engine performs. And when you're not in test mode, nine times of some of the most poisonous types of gases come out of the tailpipe of these diesel vehicles. Which causes respiratory problems. In September, emissions cheating was exposed in 11 million other VW cars worldwide. None of the cars have been recalled in the U.S. and are still safe to drive. But the company could owe the EPA billions of dollars in fines, including nearly 400 million associated with the latest batch of cars. The latest batch of cars includes Porsches, Audis. I mean, we're talking, you know, high-end vehicles. And this has caused the mainstream press, like Cars.com and the New York Times and a bunch of others that are running pieces that, it's, that are basically saying that proprietary software is the blame. They say outright fraud is possible because of proprietary software. Uh, and I think this is remarkable. They say it's a bad situation to get far, far worse. You throw a perfectly good phone away after two or three years because components goes bad. But because the manufacturer refuses to provide parts and code updates, really, as the driver of an old but beloved car that, uh, that owns that owes its latest uh, 50,000 miles to the abilities of mechanics who understand the engine's technology, uh, which is a huge, great point, by the way. Uh, I, I, uh, they say, they go on to point out that the, a day is coming when great cars get scrapped because the automaker decided it was time to force me to buy a new one. Uh, this is Andy Anako writing for cars.com. In that, in that same report, you know, he touches on the same thing we were talking about the other week, um, you know, with Apple users not owning their software, only licensing it. Uh, here we see that more and more carpet companies, in this case, General Motors lawyers, have defended the practice that you don't own the General Motors software in your car. They do. Yeah. You have no right to play with it or tinker it or make sure that it's not polluting more than you think. Right. Nine times more than they say it is. You go in to get it tested, and it's then polluting nine times more than you thought it was. You go in to get it tested. Yep. I hope uh, they're uh, revising the tests here as well. Maybe something you stick in the tailpipe while it drives around. Pronoun, uh, you, uh, you had a comment about proprietary software by lot. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I think some law entity in Europe actually... Um, had a law that you have to put proprietary software on cars so they can't be hacked. Huh. Uh, that is horrible. And uh, obviously, uh, this would be an underscoring reason why that would be a bad idea. Uh, Wimpy, what do you have here uh, from the podcast uh, on episode season 8, episode 34 of the Ubuntu uh, podcast? Sorry, it, it, that was the wrong link. It's oh. the one after that about the uh, Librarian of Congress. Oh, yes, yeah, from the EFF. Yes, and actually, uses. this is kind of where it's going. We kind of touched um, on this last week. Yeah, good point. But there's a particular point in there about how this affects car security research, repair, and modification. What did you catch? Um, that they've recognized the need for vehicle owners to circumvent access restrictions in order to repair, yeah. modify, and tinker. Yeah. And one of the things in this VW case is that you're not able to actually determine what the proprietary software is doing or not doing with regard to these uh, test emission levels and, and, and how the car is being ch tuned is because it's DRM protected. And because of the DMCA, you're not allowed to you know, hack it. But under this provision, you now are. This is a big deal. Yeah. This is a really big deal. And it, it is the Librarian of Congress has extended this uh, DMCA, I guess, exemption to also phones and tablets, too. Uh, and I wonder if this whole Volkswagen catastrophe isn't partly responsible for this. It seems to be turning the tide in at least some of the public perception. So here is now, I just, I don't want to be like this guy, but I just want to put this out there. So let's be realistic. The industry is what it is. They're not going to be, it's not going to be kumbaya, open source, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be, at best, people reverse engineering and figuring things out. This software, this stuff, is literally going to affect our lives. It is the stuff that runs our cars, the stuff that runs the trains, the stuff that runs the drones, the stuff that runs all of this. Chris, just just imagine for a second if uh, SISA or TTPIP uh, or the TTP was in full effect. The person that would have found this bug in the uh, Volkswagen software would be going to jail. Right. And North Ranger, you also kind of wanted to play on that on the DMCA laws. Well, yeah. I mean, what Wimpy pointed out with the um, exemption granted by the U.S. Cop uh, or the Librarian of Congress. Um, still doesn't fix, uh, I wouldn't call it a loophole, it's a, it's a big catch with the DMCA, is that 
the Library of Congress exemption only allows individuals to um, bypass uh, circumvention in things like you know cars and uh, video games with servers. It it's still a criminal act to distribute tools to break those. Wimpy, right? That's a good point. Wimpy actually has a really good point about how this could be a great opportunity to explain it to regular users about why DR, DRM and DMCA stuff is so bad. Go ahead, Wimpy. Well, you know, normally we associate DRM with content, and if you try and explain why DRM is bad because it protects video or music content to, you know, your friends and family outside of the open source world, right. that's a difficult sell. But if you explain this story that the software, automotive software, is DRM protected and may be tuning the car differently for its test cycle than when it's on the road, but nobody can prove that because it's DRM protected. It's a better way to explain why DRM is a bad thing and we shouldn't have it. Now that we're sitting here at the end of the year, this scandal's actually gotten even worse. More vehicles are impacted, and Popey, uh, you were saying you had some thoughts on this. I'm curious what you think now, looking back at it. Yeah, right back when it came out, there was, there was a lot of... Uh, thought it, it felt like uh, the american um system was it was looking at european cars and like casting aspersions on these yeah. horrible european cars right. and and it and i was i was pretty certain back then that other other manufacturers will be hauled over the coals as well and that's turned out you know to be the case and it's it's a much wider problem than just uh volkswagen and i think people are more cognizant of uh relying on testing in general and i think things outside the motor industry are starting to be scrutinized a little bit more and there's been reports of uh, um, airlines who are uh, reporting certain levels of efficiency that aren't actually true either so it's people i think this has triggered in people's minds that you can't just believe you know the very strict test case that was done in the laboratory and actually there are real world scenarios that you need to think about as well and I think it's also there is a good discussion happening now around if software is going to be uh, in these machines that are so important to our daily lives, is there a reasonable expectation that I can pull it apart and look at it and audit it? And uh, that conversation right. isn't uh, very strong and it hasn't gone very far, but at least it's happening. I think it's tied in too. Like we saw this year, uh, the Linux Foundation is now backing like the real-time kernel. Like right. before where things like BlackBerry's QNX were kind of dominant in the automotive scene. Hopefully we'll see more things where like you could reasonably build the stack that Volkswagen uses and do some tests before you even saw it. Oh, exactly. That's a great point. Uh, Bobby, were you going to... Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a popular talk that Karen Sandler, who used to be on the Gnome Foundation, I think she's now for works at the Software Freedom uh, Conservancy, uh, where she gives a, a keynote about the fact that she's got a pacemaker, and uh, when when it was to be installed, she asked, "Can I, you know, can I see the software?" And uh, the doc the surgeons and doctors had never been asked that question before, and and it's very similar, you know. We, there's a device that that is keeping her alive, you know. That's you know, could potentially be non-free software in the same way that, you know, you're cruising down the motorway at 90 miles an hour or whatever, and uh, there's a piece of software inside that car that's, you know, preventing the car from just veering off the road yeah. and, like, slamming into the into the wall. You know, there's, there's, there, there is a, an expectation that we should be able to look at that code, and that, that hasn't quite reached those engineers yet, I don't think. Yeah, that is a uh, that is a good point, and maybe uh, maybe that'll change over time, and maybe those companies now that are creating that software will uh, be minimized by other offerings by platforms out there that they just become the hardware maker and somebody else becomes the software provider. And I think it's just very early days. It's very and but it is. I'm glad we're watching it now because I, I think that we have an important view on this particular topic. So I think it's, I think 2016 is going to be even more revealing on this. Stay uh, tuned to Linux Unplugged. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> uh, snappy for pacemakers. You heard it here. Well, exactly. I mean, I mean, you joke, but Snappy <laughs> is legitimately a serious solution to this problem we talk about constantly on TechSnap, and that is. How are you going to make sure that these are not home router 2.0, where they just you get these old Linux running devices out there that never get patches, and now you have things like universally uh, UNPMP is is vulnerable in all these devices? Snappy has a reasonable answer to that, and I I I wonder if through 2016 if we won't see that uh, pick up and see more and more adoption there because it's it's a damn yeah, good so. solution. 
if I don't say so myself. If I don't say so myself. Um, so, th- yeah, the VW scandal stuff, I think it was interesting to talk about VW, but like Pokey, Popey said, it turns out it's applicable to a lot more people, and it really is more about the broader conversation around that software being locked away. And again, audibility in general. <clears throat> I also liked our conversation around uh, DRM that uh, came out of that. Uh, before we get into uh, the rest of the clips, and uh, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, OpenSUSE Leap. OpenSUSE made major transformations uh, this year, and uh, it was nice to have R. Brown, the chairman of SUSE, just stop by and uh, chat with us about it because, I mean, talk about the horse's mouth, right? And uh, because they've been going through so many changes, it was particularly appreciated. So we're going to get to that here in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Ting. I, I don't... Uh, I don't know if I'm there yet, but my goodness, I'm closing in on my third year of Ting service. Wowee. Holy smokes. And you can can get in on it, too. Go to linux.ting.com. First of all, you get to type Linux in your history bar, which looks way better than RedTube. Let's be honest. So linux.ting.com. But even better than that, that lets Ting know you heard about it here on the Unplugged Show, and you support this show. You get to find out a little more and they have a savings calculator. I invite you to click that and see how much you would save. Put your actual usage in there. Linux.ting.com. Go there, try it out, get the $25 discount off your first device, or if you have a Ting compatible device, and you might. You probably do. You get GSM, you, if you got GSM and CDMA network, so you got a lot of choices. If you have a compatible device, you'll get $25 of service credit, which paid for more than my first month. They have an early termination relief program, so they'll help you get out of a contract if a duopoly talked you into that. That's really, really nice. And, you know, I was over at the Ting site. Wes, look at this freaking deal. The OG Nexus 5, 190 hey, that bucks. that looks like my phone. 190 bucks, what no a contract. Deal. You get the Google experience, no contract. It's not locked. You have full access to it. They don't get in the way of any updates. Yep, exactly. You get those Google updates right there on the phone, 190 bucks. Bootloader unlocked. Pay for what you use. It's just flat $6 for the phone, and then it's your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. If you're Wi-Fi savvy, this is a crazy deal. I've got three phones. I'm paying like 40, 45 bucks a month. See, that's great. Like, Personally, I'm lucky enough that my my employer, they're willing to pay a certain amount of my uh, yeah. cell phone fee so that, that they helps. can call me, right? And I think a lot of people are in that position. Ting is great for that. Like, I have a set amount. How am I going to go over that amount yeah. on Ting, right? Like, yeah. that means my cell phone plan is covered. So you're making money on the deal I, sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, cl- that's really clever, Wes. <laughs> And thanks to Ting. Yeah. Linux.ting.com to support this show and get it on the deal with a ton of good devices. Everything from just like a bare bones GSM card and feature phone all the way up to the latest and greatest Android devices and internet phone devices from Apple. Try out that savings calculator, plug in your usage, see how much you would actually save, and then realize you now have the flexibility of choosing GSM or CDMA whenever you want, like a boost. Linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. And a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged Show all year long. Linux.ting.com. And thanks to you guys for going there and keeping us going. All right. So uh, let's get into our conversation about OpenSUSE Leap with Mr. Hello. R. Brown. Hey, hey. All right. Well, I'm I am really pumped about episode 118 today because we have a ton of topics to cover, a lot of distro things to discuss. So let's kick off the distro things with one Richard Brown, Open Sousa's, or I believe Sousa's chairman. I forget. It was a very it was a very very cool title. The chairman of Open Sousa, Mr. Richard Brown. Please Richard, tell us more. R. Brown, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and it's it's chairman of Open Sousa, but Sousa paid for me my salary, so. Okay. I work okay. For both. So technically, the SUSE company pays your paycheck, but you're the chairman of the Open SUSE distribution, which honestly is way cooler than CEO or any other oh, title. Yeah, definitely. Chairman is awesome. So, uh, uh, Richard, welcome to Linux Unplugged. And today is a pretty cool week because Open SUSE 42.1 Leap shipped, and uh, it's like Linux, but not like we've seen it before. Are 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 you guys totally pumped over there at OpenSUSE right now? Yeah, I mean, and the, the 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 feedback's been amazing. I mean, we we're trying something really different here. For people who don't know, you know, we've got the effectively the code base from SUSE Linux Enterprise, so the enterprise distribution, and we started with that. But then, rather than just copying it and you know shipping that as our own, we've built a whole new platform on top of it. 
And and this and this is something that we've almost have, as Linux users have, have fantasized about, and it almost seems impossible. And it is this idea that you take a core, uh, you take the core Linux OS, and you make it stable, you make it you make it secure, you make it predictable. But then, as an end user, you get you get all of the trappings of nice updated end user applications and things like that. You can get the latest things that are important to you still. Yeah, you know, you know, the small things without like your kernel or X breaking. Yeah, you like things like Thunderbird, Chrome, your Steam packages, right. things like that. And uh, now, that is one thing to say is actually going to happen, but. Uh, how how what is the long term plan to actually deliver on that? How do, how does OpenSUSE the Leap plan to actually make that happen? Well, part of it's all thanks to the the tooling we already have, so things like the build service, which make it really easy for us to do this kind of heavy, tricky engineering. So that the trick going forward is we're gonna do Leap minor releases aligned with the the SLE service pack. So as they move forward, we'll move forward. And for each of those minor releases, which are expected about once per year, I expect to see most of that user space stuff kind of jumping up, catching up with what's common standard there, with SUSE taking care of the base system underneath as part of the enterprise stuff. Now, Richard, what happens when something comes along that says, this is, uh, this is the new standard, this is something we want to do, and it requires XYZ be updated? Is there a process in which a maintainer can step up and say, I'm going to make sure that these libraries and this this end user package are the latest version, even though it doesn't quite track what what Slash is doing. Exactly. I mean that that's happened a few times already with with this version of Leap. Um, we actually did it with the kernel as well. So we we had a real big bit of community feedback that you know they wanted the 4.1 kernel in there, you know, something newer than what Slee has. So yeah, we, we've done that already. I expected probably hit a few more things again with 42.2 but uh, also we're seeing on the enterprise side because we're doing this they're a little bit braver about some of the stuff they're talking about for service pack 2 hmm, so that's awesome we we you know they might yeah. be moving a little bit faster we might have a little bit less of that kind of thing to hit than we were expecting when we started this a year ago so i i mean so far i've mostly talked about this in the context of the desktop and why it seems compelling to me as a desktop distribution but um is there also a bit of a server answer here? Could this be maybe somebody who wants to have some fairly f- modern, up-to-date front-end packages of things like maybe SyncThing, uh, Plex, MB, stuff like that, but also then also have something that doesn't have a ton of kernel changes and whatnot? Is there? Do you see a role for OpenSUSE Leap in the server position, or is that clearly still defined for SLES? What's your thoughts there? If definitely, totally, yes. I mean, as part of this release, we, we actually tied it up all of the server patterns and installation options we have in Leap so mm. that they're, they're a lot more straightforward and easy to get done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a big server market out there that, that doesn't really fit Leap, uh, doesn't really fit Sleep. So, right. you know, there, there, there's not really too much concern from the SUSE business side. You know, we, we're going for a different direction. We're going to appeal to a different audience. So, it's yeah, we're looking forward to seeing how that so works out. What, you know, one of the things that I think I've noticed that Ubuntu has had to uh, figure out with their LTS releases, and I think they've done it pretty gracefully, is uh, the the updates to the kernel to do hardware enablements, as they call them. And uh, one of the things that I, I hear consistent, consistently, Richard, is... And it happens about right now, and Wes knows what I'm about to say, is Ubuntu 14.04 is starting to feel real old. And he and I know of a couple of examples of people who wanted to go with the LTS release but bailed because it's just simply – it's too out of date now. And I, it seems like the LTS updates are and to, to Ubuntu and the SLES service packs are on about the same schedule. So what, what? how can Leap avoid this problem where some of the base system starts to become honestly a little stale? And so things like you know Steam games start to suffer or new hardware support or honestly even things like installing the latest versions of Java and Flash to play Minecraft and, and do Hangouts become complicated. What's, what's Leap? solution to that well um the slee service pack thing is, is moving up to about an annual release schedule now and and hardware enablement is a big part of what SUSE do in those service packs hmm. um so 
we'll be benefiting from that plus you know probably doing some of our own as well for the specific hardware that our community is interested in so yeah we we, we did with that 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 should kind of be the bread and butter that every year when we do a minor release of leap hardware enablement should be there every time keeping this whole thing fresh and would that be when i get say a new version of gtk or would that come at a different point in update in the update cycle we're, we're really expecting kind of the big things like a, a new GNOME release, a new KDE release to be sort of synchronized all around those annual service packs we're going to be doing. So, Minor releases, as we're saying. For so essentially, I get one new version of GTK a year, one new version of QT a year, and those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, the OpenSUSE packaging policy isn't necessarily that strict. So if there's a, like a, a nice compelling reason for us to push that out as a maintenance update during the life cycle of 42.1, we can, we might. But there has to be a reason because the last thing we want to do is break things. Now, how do you know, now down the road, in all intents and purposes, is there going to be a uh, 42.2 and a 42.3? Or is this essentially a continuously updating installation that I'm going to have that will never – that's always just going to – like 42.1 is always going to be the latest and whatever you install is just going to continually be updated. How does this work and what is my upgrade path long term? I don't know. If, if you if you want a nice rolling release, that's what we have Tumbleweed for. So that's your single installation that you can upgrade. Um, so uh, forty two dot one will have forty two dot two next year. The upgrade path will be as simple as a, a zipper dump, so our equivalent of a uh, apt distribution upgrade. And so you know we're expecting that to be nice and simple. You can also do it offline if you feel like doing it the old fashioned way over a <laughs> USB stick or a DVD. That's good. Um, yeah, and, and so, yeah, we're expecting these to, to uh, do one of these service packs every year. Um, then when SLE do SLE 13 a few years from now, that's when we're expecting 43.0, which will be sort of a big, huge change everything, probably based on wherever Tumbleweed is around about that time. Okay. So and that'll I, be in line is, with what the SUSE are doing with the, the big enterprise release then as well. This sounds like it's, the way you describe it, it's kind of a unique little space in the Linux ecosystem. Yeah, it does seem different. And I, and I look at this and I ask, so I guess, Richard, my, my next question would be, if I'm, uh, if I'm Frank from OwnCloud or if I'm somebody who's making, say, a Telegram server replacement or, you know, maybe Plex or whatever, if I'm creating software for the Linux server or the Linux desktop, how do I, as a software vendor, say we are compatible with XYZ version of OpenSUSE Leap? How can I how can I clearly differentiate for the end user so that way they know it's going to work on Leap or not? What's what is so? Because the reason I ask you is because it seems like one two years down the road there could be. Um, some installations of Leap where something does work and some installations of Leap where things don't work. So what's kind of the thoughts there to make it clear to end users if you know something's going to work on your version of OpenSUSE, say, nine months from now? The cleanest, simplest way would be I'd recommend that, that all of these vendors, like we're already in discussion, for example, with OwnCloud about doing this, uh, of, of either put your stuff in our distribution or use the build service where building it for all, for whatever variation someone might have is just a, a button click away. Nice. Because we're not expecting any major heavy architectural stuff. So if you want to be extra sure that the thing is built for you know every variation of, of Leap, that should just be nice and simply done in the OBS. Wouldn't that be wouldn't that be great if we could get just everybody using that? That oh, seems yeah. that would be really something. So if you don't mind, uh, Richard, I would love to shift gears and for just a second and talk about uh, well for a few seconds and talk uh -huh. about uh, tumbleweed. So what is uh, if I'm looking at really uh, today, you know, and, and really, and let's talk about 2016 too, I'm looking at my options as an OpenSUSE user and I'm looking at Tumbleweed, it seems like, and I'm looking at Leap. I got two different things in front of me. Uh, I feel like maybe because I'm an Arch user today, if I was going to make a switch to SUSE, maybe I want to go Tumbleweed. And I, I actually kind of want to ask you straight up, what, why would I not go Tumbleweed and why would I go leap? Like, what's the downside to going tumbleweed? If there's two different versions of SUSE, what is what is leap giving me that say tumbleweed isn't? It, it leaps giving you a, a slower pace of change. It's really down to like what Linux is comfortable for you. You know, the thing we find with tumbleweed is you know we, we've tackled those technical problems. It's stable. It works. You can rely on it. But it's changing at whatever the pace upstreams are. And we have feedback from our users saying like, ah, I didn't want to relearn my entire workflow this week. <laughs> so you know, tumbleweed. If if you're if you're one of these guys who who likes whatever upstreams are doing. 
tumbleweed is fine, great, use it. But at the same time, in certain use cases, or just depending on how you are, you want something that changes less often, that's what Leap's going for as a, as a kind of, you know, the two complementary approaches, really. Yeah. So if, and, and, and also maybe if I was a, if I was the administrator of a couple of SUSE Enterprise Linux servers. Or even more than a couple. Yeah. Leap would probably be a pretty good desktop for me. We had a lot of people in our virtual lug try out Leap after that episode and Tyler's here and he had it installed. And Tyler, I'm kind of curious now looking back on it. How's your experience been? So far I installed it uh, last month, not long after it came out, upgraded from uh, 13.2. Uh, first couple of weeks, the experience was a little bit rough on the edges. Uh, I was trying to reinstall everything I had before, but I think now that I've had it for about a month and a half now, it's uh, rock solid. Rock solid. That's a bold statement. Nice. Good to hear that. I'm curious. We'll check in in a few more months and see if that's still the case. Because I still maintain, I think it's a great idea, and I think Tumbleweed and Leap are both exactly what they should be doing. But in a year from now, that's really going to be the telling thing. How many things got backported? How many things actually made it in How there? How many times have they changed direction? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 I'm not saying any of that's going to be negative. Or no, it's not be, at all. It's just how do those we things... We just don't know yet. Right. And, and because in particular, these types of distributions, there's so many unanswered questions. It's just going to be a little bit to see how that plays out. But, you know, the folks over there are super clever. And so if anybody could get it right, it is probably them. And so I'm kind of glad they're doing it. I'm encouraged to watch it. All right. So this brings us to the last clip we're going to play on the show today. And uh, it was the one that was the most fun for me. And I'm betting probably surprising for you, Wes. Uh, That was when uh, Wimpy came on here and he dropped the pie bomb. And then we got into discussion about the future of open PC. Uh, Wimpy, I, I kind of wanted to pick your brain because I know you've hinted before on some pre and post shows that... And I haven't gotten got I have quite not yet gotten the complete picture, but the Raspberry Pi is starting to play a more and more important role for the Ubuntu Mate distro, isn't it? It's our most popular platform. Wow. So you mean the, you mean other than x86 or including x86? It's more popular than Sixty-four bit, thirty-two bit, x86. Holy shit! <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. Oh, my world has just been rocked. Are you kidding me? No, it's downloaded about 1,200 times a day, the image for the Pi 2. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. That's serious. That is, yeah. that is, yeah. so what are your thoughts on that? Well, it means that in the last two releases of Ubuntu Mate, I've done the work for the Pi version in the last month of the release. Right. But for this release, it's got even, um, you know, it's being treated equally all the way through the development stage now. I I feel like I need to take a minute. Like, I wasn't ready for that level of a bomb to be dropped. Uh, I don't know why I didn't know that, because I kind of feel like I should have known that. But I, to me, is shocking well, to me, actually. I've, I've, actually, I've actually been uh, paying attention to a lot of communities around Raspberry Pi and, you know, Reddit or Google Plus and various different places. And the majority of times people ask what to put on the Pi... Uh, no, Raspbian is no longer even mentioned. Ubuntu, Ubuntu Mate is always the first choice. I mean, it makes it makes it sense. does make. I mean, it's way more pleasant to use and the yeah. defaults, and it looks pretty. Wimmy, that's a that's a big deal, though. I mean, congratulations because that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so, when you look at these types of devices, are you starting to say, "All right, this these aren't just sort of toys; these are going to become possibly the next open PC." Now, uh, hold on. Before I, I want to make sure I'm framing this right, but when I look at tablets and phones, I get a little sad because they look locked down and glued together. And I, I, I remember a time when I was in high school and I scraped together parts for months and months and months and built my first PC. I went and picked out my own case and it was, it was, it was a life moment for me. And you learned a lot along the way. A ton of stuff. And I read, I read, I mean, it was really my first geek project that I really researched and all that kind of stuff. And now I look at this uh, Onion Omega here and I'm sitting here like Legos building a PC and I think, geez, I could give this to my kid and he could play Minecraft on this and maybe not this one, but the Raspberry Pi Zero. I mean, I, I, this is maybe getting to the point now where, uh, it is actually going to be something that has some serious long-term legs as a serious desktop contender. And one more thing, Wimpy, before I toss it back to you is I, in the uh, late 90s, 
had a conversation with a guy named Scott, really great guy, and his job, his day job was to run an IBM mainframe. And he looked down at um, desktop PCs as toys uh, that couldn't do real work, that didn't weren't powerful yeah. enough. And he called he called the desktops, uh, oh, you mean those Mattel inside PCs? Those Mattel inside, because they were toys. Right. And, you know, and I look at the Omega and I go, oh, this is a cute Lego toy. But actually, maybe I'm looking at it from Scott's perspective. And when you when Wimpy says he's getting over 1,000 downloads a day, Wimpy, I'm wondering, are you looking at this and are these mini PCs, these Raspberry Pis and these Omegas and, and the Bagel Bone and all, whatever, are you looking at this and going, this might actually be something that gets wider adoption use than the traditional PC one day? I think so. Certainly, if you look outside of the developed nations, I think this is going to be the print. The ARM-based um, devices are going to be the principal computing platform. And if you're not doing stuff on ARM, you'll be irrelevant. Wow, bad time to own Intel stock. I am still sort of sitting here going, "Damn, that is a that is a big deal." And Wimpy, I'm curious. You know, it's been a few weeks. Is there any follow up thoughts to that segment? Um, yeah, a couple. Um, so. Just before Christmas, we're going to release a point release ooh, of Ubuntu Mate 1510. So we're going to uh, uh, update some of the bits and pieces that are, are in the image and fix a couple of bugs. So not a major respin, but I have moved the build over to the Ubuntu Pi Flavor Maker project. So alongside the Ubuntu Mate release will also be a spin of Ubuntu 1510, Zubuntu 1510, and also Ubuntu Server. <laughs> So um, people can come and have a, a real Ubuntu Christmas on their Raspberry Pi 2s. Yeah, I mean, that is sort of perfect for the holidays, uh, people getting Raspberry Pis. Like uh, like we started at the beginning of the show, this Cano here, or however you say it, Canoe, or whatever you say, you know, that's a Raspberry Pi 2, and I'm I'm putting that under the Christmas tree this year. And yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be, I'm going to put Ubuntu Mate on there. That's a fork and on, when we, of course. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago about this, and you were surprised at the uptake of these ARM boards... I thought about it, and um, there was a guy who supplied a bit of feedback to the Linux Voice podcast where he talked about, he, made, he drew a parallel between uh, where the engineers for steam engine construction were in the UK during the Industrial Re Revolution, uh, and it wasn't where the money was, it was where the raw materials were. And he likened this to Linus and creating Linux in the, as a 21-year-old student the raw materials that were available to Linux was a um, Intel PC. Mm -hmm. And that's why Linux was created on an Intel PC. And these days, the raw materials that are readily accessible and available to most people around the world are these ARM SBCs. And it's those boards that are going to drive the tinkering and the hobbying and the enthusiasts that we all were with our PCs, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And these are going to be the new devices that yeah. people learn about computers on. You know, that that really rings true with me. In uh, 121 when, is when you sort of drop what I call the pie bomb on us. Uh, th that That's when it clicked with me. And I think we even talk about it in the clip is uh, I realized that if I was a high school student or even a little younger or in that range, this would be my experimental PC platform because – the Dells and the Lenovo's and the Apple of this world have sealed the hoods and put everything under a plastic wrap with glue. And even then, like, I have admittedly fond memories of breaking my parents, you know, like desktop computer oh, when yeah. I was a kid, right? Sure, and, yeah. Yeah. But these days, for like 30 bucks, you're like, oh, here, here's your whole machine. Just right. go wild. Yeah. And it makes or, it reasonable to give it a gift. Or five dollars. Or even. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that is, that has been an amazing trend to really, I mean, to see that come down this year. Really something. And then to see the actual usage tick up in the downloads for Ubuntu Mate Edition. Really cool. And it, and it just makes so much sense. It really does. So uh, I, I just find that to be fascinating. And I can only imagine where 2016 is going to take it. Because 2015, awesome. it rocked in 2015. It rocked. And it's funny, you know, it totally just not planned at all. Here we are with this canoe system that, <laughs> that we unboxed today on the show. And it is... It is so much. It's beautiful, well designed. Yeah, and it it brings all the current open source technology. It it is really something to see this, and I just as a kid would have loved this. Uh, and they also have mobile apps to manage this system, and they have them in the Play Store and the App Store. It says at Team Canoe or Cano K N O. 
K A N O. K A N O. Can't understand K-A-N-O. Chris. I know K A N O. I know it's hard to pronounce. I think I want to say canoe because it's like the idea is like it's a canoe. Or Kano? But Kano doesn't make any sense. Uh, anyways, I think they just sent this to me. I don't. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I don't think I backed this particular project. I think they just sent it to me to talk about it, and so I'm. I'm pretty. I'm pretty impressed. Wes, something else I'm kind of impressed with. We decided since this is a holiday episode of the Unplugged Show, it that sure is. We would drink a little. Uh, a little uh, beer, as we do. From time to time. And this is something you brought, and you wanted to get something specifically in the holiday spirit, Wes. So I, I, I won't steal your thunder. What did you bring in? Well, we are currently drinking Stone Coffee Milk Stout. Yeah, it's an ale brewed with roasted coffee bean. Does that mean it's caffeinated? I believe so. One would hope, anyway. That is actually pretty great. And so when you drink it, it definitely has like a coffee note. Uh, there's, no, there's no getting around that. It's, it's 5% alcohol by volume. And uh, which is a little lower than I usually bring. I'm just oh, going to say really? that right yeah. now. <laughs> that is true. Oh, yeah, for the show. Yeah, for sure. So it's Stone Coffee Milk Stout, a bittersweet, creamy, coffee laced stout from Imperial Stouts to IPAs. We've discovered through the delicious trial and error that the tantalizing roasty lift that comes from adding coffee beans to just about any beer style. And they go on. It does a- pair nicely. I got to say, it's. It's darn it, smooth. You know, when you brought in, I was like, uh, coffee and a beer. I've done beers tasty before. This doesn't usually go well for me. Uh, and you know what? It went really well. It's pretty good. Yeah, this was a great beer to drink during the show. So thank you, Wes, for bringing Absolutely. us in. Absolutely. And I think we're going to give it the Linux Unplugged uh, thumbs up. Thumbs? Two thumbs up. Stone coffee, milk, stout. Somebody in the mumble room, I think, was saying they have just about every stone brew ever. I don't know who that was, but... Uh, Anybody in there, a, a Stone Beer uh, fan or aficionado that could uh, chime in and give us more information? Because we just basically brought, picked up the bottles here. We sure did. Yeah. But, but I mean, I've I've enjoyed their IPA in particular in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm a con. Yeah, I'm a con. He's got it right there. He's got it dialed in. That's who it was. So there you go. Oh, thanks, Wes. It's mm-hmm. very good. And if you guys have any suggestions, feel free to submit those and uh, we will drink them and talk about them on air. We should. You know what? Maybe, you know, that'd be fun to do that because, uh, you know, one of the things... That the original, so there was two original ideas for Linux Unplugged. One of them was so terrible, I almost feel like I shouldn't even say it because it's embarrassing. Say it. I, I, yeah. It's for people who like to mess with computers. If you're, and you know who you are, if you're somebody who doesn't want to mess with the, I just want to surf the, I just want to buy something on Amazon, send an email to my kids, look at some websites. All right, so I've, I had to play a little Leo while I could think about it. Um, I, I hate dead air. Uh, so, you know, the first idea for Linux Unplugged was I get so much email that comes into Linux Action Show, I'm just going to start a podcast where I just read my damn email because I'm never getting to it. And, and the only thing, the only work I get done is the work I have to get done to make sure shows go on the air because that's all I have. That's all I have in me. And it's the only thing I get done is like, and, and it's like, it's like big things. I'm not even like, there's things in my life that are extremely important, like health insurance or insurance. I mean, all these things, I don't get those done. What I get done is whatever I have to get done to make sure these shows go on the air. And so I was like, <clears throat> this email is never getting done. I'm never reading all these emails. What I'm going to do is, and actually, I, this is the real concept here. I'm going to take Thunderbird, I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to tag emails throughout the week, and then I'm going to go to that tag in Thunderbird, and I'm just going to read them on the air, and I'm going to answer them, and that's the freaking podcast. You know, Richard Dawkins has a whole YouTube thing. He just reads his hate mail. Yeah. I think it could work yeah, the same so way. Yeah, so that was the idea. Uh, but really, I that was a horrible idea. It was so, so boring. But then the second idea, I think, is kind of solid, and it's actually what's inspired the show in reality. Uh, because the emails have over time become less and less a part of the show. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Fancy uh, that. Yeah. Uh, the, the concept that I've actually ran with was what does, the, you know, what does the world look like to real actual Linux users? Because there is a lot of blogs and press out there who claim to be Linux users or Linux advocates or Linux journalists, and they don't actually use Linux. And so they, they miss the mark, and they don't actually represent the day-to-day actual Linux user. And so often that means they spin things, or they misunderstand things, or they superficially read things, or, and, the, and their reviews are touching on true and tried uh, talking points that we've been discussing since the 90s, and they're just exhausted, and we get so sick and tired of it. And, and really, if, if we're Linux users and something like 
Chrome comes along and it all of a sudden is downloading a binary package in the background that turns on our microphone, how as Linux users does that make us feel? If Volkswagen is all of a sudden revealed for altering test results because of their proprietary software as Linux users, what is our thought about that? And you, know, you can go back through every single topic we played in this show and you can see how we come at it from the, from the perspective of people who use Linux on a daily basis and thus, effect, thus affects our worldview. And, and, and you combine the fact that we have this virtual lug that comes in and discusses their opinions on things and they represent that point of view as well. I think it makes for a very unique kind of talk show that is not like anything else because we have a we have gotten extremely lucky with it, with it really solid contributions from our community. I mean absurdly lucky. We shouldn't be able to have an open mumble room and have this many great contributors come in. Oh it, and it speak really intelligently. makes the right, show. Right. So so uh, somehow we we just fell backwards into that and that is you know just a resource that has been extremely useful. Plus you have our perspective as people who are open source advocates first and Linux desktop users. Uh, I think it has made for a, for an interesting perspective for a, for a talk show that can handle a whole range of topics from political to technical. Uh, and that is the second idea that has really I kind of ran with for this show. And uh, now here we are after all of this. And there has been some really interesting things. Like one of the things I really enjoyed, one of the things we did this year that I thought was kind of fun is when we went to LinuxCon, we did Unplugged Live from LinuxCon. And it was a little rough because like we literally just like found a spot and 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 when we got there, I don't know if Noah wants me to tell the story. So nobody nobody share this with Noah. Don't tell Noah. He won't listen to this episode. He's no, got he a. He doesn't family. listen to any of these. No, he does. He listens to Unplugged. But come on, this is the Christmas episode. Right. He won't have time to listen nope. to this. And he doesn't know I've been drinking. Beer. Anyway, Noah, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> so we get we're at, we're at the Seattle Convention Center. This is like a legit professional convention center, and there is an area they have where they have these benches that have plugs. And uh, networking, and it's like the, you know, sit down and workstation. And there's like four of them, and they're in front of windows. They're nice, but they're all taken. And so uh, we get there, and I go, oh, no, this was, our, this was our last kind of plan, and all of these spots are taken. What do we do? He's like, what do you mean, what do we do? What do we do? He's like, you start setting up. I go, what do you mean you start setting up? He says, you start setting up. You start setting up, and they'll get out of the way. Because we look so official with all this equipment that once we start setting it down, they get out of the way. And I'm like, that, that doesn't work. And he's like, let's try it. So we go over there and we bring over these, uh, we have these uh, Pelican cases and we, we open them up and we start sending up microphones and cameras and mixers, right? And we start computers and sure enough, everybody at the table just gets up and walks away. And they move to another table. They just totally got out of our way and we were able to Beauregard this spot for two hours. We boondocked in this spot for two hours and managed to record the Linux Unplug show. And so we were able to do a live Linux Unplugged on location. And then we took pre-recorded material where we did interviews and recorded a bunch of stuff and brought that into the Linux Action Show pre-produced. It was really kind of more refined. And I really liked that sort of ebb and flow between Unplugged and Last this year where we went on location, did the live raw nitty-gritty stuff in Unplugged. We were even able to bring the mumble room to the Linux convention with us, which was totally badass. And then in Last, we had the more refined cut-down versions and I think that was kind of a cool thing that we... So I, I, I want to play with more more of that next year. Yeah. That's kind of cool. The synchronicity between Last and Unplugged. That was nice. And then last but not least, I think one of my favorite things about Linux Unplugged this year, of course, was Wes joining the cast. Well, thank you, sir. That wasn't... You know what, Wes? You have been a great con you've been a great addition, and you've had great contributions to the show. I'm very pleased to be here. And you usually bring beer. Hey, that so that's So that's, uh, that's pretty solid, too. And then, of course, last but not least... Our mumble room. Now we're gonna have one more episode this year. This isn't the last episode yes, of the year. Please be here. But uh, if you want to get your crystal ball and be real prognosticating and sound super smart, or put yourself out on the line, join us for 125 uh, in the mumble room. Thank you, mumble room, though, for great contributions this year. Uh, you guys, you know, playing back those clips. It's obvious you guys help make the show. Yeah, absolutely. So it means a lot to us. You can join us live over at jblive.tv. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it converted to your local time zone. Linux action show .com to submit content. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Have a great holiday. And we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>